The BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Dennis Norton, and Frank Muir. Round one tries to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they get the meanings of these words roughly right. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Dillis, what is sake? S-A-K-E. It's a drink. Mm. What kind? Uh, a Japanese yes. intoxicant. Yeah. You drink it out of a small kind of cup. Yes. You get it poured, you have it with your meal, and it's not at all nice. Do you remember what it's fermented from? I haven't the faintest idea. It was from about, Old boot laces. From about 1042 <laughs> AD. I think rice. that's good enough. It is, in fact, rice. fermented from rice. Too much. Dennis Norton. What is a summer boy? S O N O B U O Y. I think it's probably Sono boy, not Sun. S O N O B U O Y, Sono boy. I was going to pull you up on it. It is Sono boy. It's a thing that climbs upon your knee. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be very odd. It, uh, I don't know what it's looking for in that case, Dennis. Um, B U O Y. Yes. It's in the sea. Yeah. Oh, it's one of those radar boys. And what's it picking up? <laughs> <laughs> Girls. Oh, yes, yes. Depends if it gets lucky. You signals, know. signals. Yes. Picks from up. ships. It's a boy for detecting submarines. It's dropped by parachute from an aeroplane and it's equipped with a hydrophone and with radio so as to transmit the sounds, presumably of the submarines, either to aircraft or to escorting vessels. It's on a boy. And Scott James. What is a ticky? T I C K E Y. Ticky. A ticky? Mm. It's a noun. Yes. I should have thought it meant bug infested. <laughs> that would, I think, not have the E. But it's I think... A now. Ah, oh, yes, I, sp um, I know what it is. It's a coin, isn't it? Yes. A threepenny bit. Jolly good. Ticky is a threepenny bit. Frank Miller, what is an abalone? A B A L O N E. Abalone. Abal abalone? Mm. Well, it's what we call this programme, you know, we meet in the pub five minutes before the show starts and they said, oh no, time we went and got on with our baloney. <laughs> <laughs> it's what? It's nice for not it's a sh What? It's shellfish. shellfish. Isn't it? It's, um, we think it might be a shellfish. It's a place in, in America. It's an American so shellfish. Uh, which coast and in the main which state? Pacific coast. Yes. Um, oh, California. Yes, yeah, all right, that'll do. <laughs> Two marks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Californian edible mollusk, but the particular thing about it is the shell is ear-shaped, and it's also lined with mother of pearl, which is more than you can say for Frank Muir's ears, as far as I know. <laughs> all right, well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down. I want the two women members of each uh, of the team to study them, and at the end of the programme, I shall ask them for the source of the quotation. So, first, Dillis Powell and Frank Miller, your quotation is, it's a long way to Tipperary. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, your quotation is, fair laughs the morn and soft the zephyr blows. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their ideas of how these words came to be spoken or written. Round two is a round of quickies. Christian names get shortened and altered, so William becomes Bill and Richard is Dick and so on. Two marks, I want to know what the originals of the following pet names are. Dillis Powell, Lottie. Charlotte. Yes. How many marks do I give this time, Valerie? Do you think one or two? two one for them, two for us. <laughs> <laughs> two marks it's got to be. Dennis Norton, Sandy. Sandy. Sandy is the son of a beach. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it's Alexander. Alexander, it is. Anne Scott James. Molly. Molly. Molly's Molly. Yeah. It's not short for anything. Emma Mollis. Mm, 
Mary. Yes. Mary. Well, how can Ma Molly be short for Mary? Mary. Yeah. <laughs> <It's long. laughs> Got one more letter. <laughs> All right. Mary is the original. Molly is not the diminutive, but the no, pet, pet it's name. It's the largative. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I said pet name at the start. Frank Muir. Sally. Sarah. It's what my daughter was supposed to be called, but I couldn't pronounce it. Because <laughs> I can't pronounce my ass. We called her Sally. So it's, it should be Sarah. Well, hang on a minute, I'll practice. Sarah. S Sarah. Sh Sarah. S Sarah. <laughs> is Sally. Sarah, Sally. Quite right. Well, the next round's about verse and poetry, more or less. Um, this is nursery rhymes, which I want the teams to complete. I'll start <clears> them. Uh, I don't want authors, because they're nearly all of them anonymous or traditional. So the marks are to be given for the knowledge of the rhymes themselves. Two marks if they get quotation right. Completed. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Please to remember the 5th of November. Gunpowder, Gun treason. And plot. <coughs> yes, that's not quite the end of it, but and it wasn't the end of the plot either. Well, it's enough for one it's rotten not. mark. Isn't it? <laughs> You get one, but not two. Please remember the 5th of November, <coughs> the gunpowder... Please remember the 5th of November, gunpowder treason and plot. We see no reason why gunpowder treason should, should ever be, be forgot. forgot. One half out of two. Traditional since the 16th century. <laughs> Dennis Norton, 30 days hath September, April, June and November. <laughs> <laughs> I learned this as 30 days hath September, April, June and my uncle. <laughs> um... <laughs> and November. All the rest have 31, excepting, what's it, excepting February, which hath 28. Alone. Alone. <laughs> That's right. All the rest have 30 won, excepting February alone. Which hath 28 Day. days clear. That's it. And 29 in each leap year. Absolutely I'm right. Done. <laughs> well done, Anne. You've got it absolutely accurate. Two marks it is. And now it's your turn. The north wind, or wine, whichever you prefer, the north wind doth blow, and we shall have snow. And what will poor Robin do then, poor thing? See, this is just about my mental level. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's he go on doing? He's got to hide his head under his wing. What no. comes in the middle? <laughs> it's an... It's, um, do you remember um, the next bit? Yes, it's got one of those rotten rhymes. Yes, that's right. Um, he said that he'll hide in a barn and keep himself warm, warm. <laughs> and hide his head under his, his wing, wing poor, poor thing. thing. Quite cha, right. cha, cha. Two marks yeah. again. Um, Frank Miller. Three wise men of Gotham went to sea in a bowl. What rhymes with bowl? Oh. Hole. Except in February, which has yeah. 28. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't rhyme, you fool. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to rhyme with bow. You no, disregard that altogether. Three wise men of Gotham went to sea in a tub. <laughs> they were looking went for to sea in a basin. <laughs> no, 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 pull no. the plug out, Jack. <laughs> <afraid. No> <laughs> <laughs> well, that's roughly what happened. Um, no marks, I'm afraid. Three wise men of Gotham went to sea in a bow, and if the bow had been stronger, my song would have been longer. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. Amusing. <laughs> Amusing. <laughs> they don't write songs like, like that, that anymore. And <laughs> <laughs> well, now we have a very serious round about origins and derivations. Shan't play. For <laughs> three marks... For three marks, if you can give me the present meanings of these words or phrases, right, and then give me the origin or derivation of them, or what they originally came from. Beginning with Dillis Power... Patent leather. Patent leather? Mm. Well, it's kind of shiny leather. Glassy, isn't it? Yes. Glassy it's very, very, kid. It's very, very shiny and it cracks. And originally, <laughs> how does no. it come, come to be called patent, patent leather? Patent leather. Oh, because somebody patented it. Well, I, some... I think that's two yes. and a half out of three. Uh, oh, it's um, <laughs> the bread of the other I half. I don't know. Well, I want to know where it was patented. Patented where? Um, Cordova. <laughs> no, not this time. <laughs> the patent office. Um, where could it have been? Which patent office? Oh. The English. No. Two and a half out of three is fair. It's a process by which the brilliant, highly polished finish is given to leather for shoes, and it can be for handbags, but it was originally protected by patents at the United States Patent Office. 
And that's why you didn't get it quite right. Two and a half out of three. Dennis Norton, the word untrammeled. Well, it means um, unhindered, yes. unrestricted. And it means not having a trammel. Now, if you're going to ask what a trammel is, that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> it comes in on the marks. <laughs> is it? I want to know what the trammel is, or what. But it's something that, if you haven't got it, it permits you to be free and... and mm. Yeah, it's a sort of girdle. <laughs> Oh, is it a bit of harness? A harness? A bit of harness. Bit of yes. harness. Yes, that's... Yes. Good. good. Um, I think you get your three marks. It means, as Dennis says nowadays, unhindered or unrestricted, and a trammel has got a fair number of meanings, but all of them are something that confines or restricts. And it can be a net for catching fish, and the bit I was after is a shackle used on horses' legs to teach them how to amble rather than trot. That's why I've passed it as being a bit of harness, but it's a rather odd bit. And it can be any impediment to free movement. It's also the hook in the fireplace on which you hang a kettle. And Scott James, pin money. Well, pin money means little bits of money. Um, left over from the housekeeping, really. Money for small purchases. Yes, and originally? I should have thought it meant the money with which you bought your pins. Yes, but why? <laughs> I should think a Victorian phrase. Yes, why particularly pins? Well, they were so small, like the pin money. Ah. Such a little tiny... Oh, I think you've got a rather female slant on this one. <laughs> yes, pin money. I should have thought it was essentially... Uh, you never talk about, oh, my son has pin money or my no. husband's pin money. Yeah. No, you, you've missed one particular point, although you've got uh, most of it right. I think two out of three. <gasps> it's um, the money that a housewife has for her own pocket money as opposed to what, what she's supposed and sometimes does spend on housekeeping. But it was originally given by the husband to the wife Definitely for purchasing pins, because pins were originally extremely expensive, and they're expensive because they were, um, as it were, taxed. It was a crown monopoly, and therefore pins, instead of being <laughs> things you buy very cheaply indeed, were extraordinarily expensive, and the poor husband had to give his wife extra money in order to buy pins. When pins became mass-produced, then uh, it stopped being pin money, but the wife didn't give it up all the same. <laughs> <laughs> Two out of three. <coughs> Frank Muir, the top brass means uh, a very senior military rank. Yes. Why? But because of uh, metal work on the hat, denoting That's a high rank. Absolutely right. It means top-ranking executives, um, in business it can be, or in the army, or any other organisation for that matter. And it was coined in the last war because high-ranking officers had guilt on the peaks of their caps. Frank, I think, speaks for the Air Force. I think the army term was more often scrambled egg. Mm. And it really, it's the same as the phrase in the First World War, which was brass hat. Three marks. Next round is famous last words. Two marks, if they get them right. Tillis Power, who said, I shall hear in heaven? Beethoven. Why? Because he was deaf. Quite right. Beethoven, who was stone deaf in his later years, it's alleged his last remark was, I shall hear in heaven. Well done. Two marks. Dennis Norton, be sure you show the mob my head. It will be a long time before they see its like. Um, well, it's somebody who was executed. Yes? The field is wide. Yeah. <laughs> be sure it's you show shortly the mob. after. What? Executed after. Yes, he said it before he was executed. <laughs> <laughs> Unless the hangman was a ventriloquist. <laughs> um... <coughs> one of those who, one of those chaps was a French chap who yes. was e executed in the French Revolution. Have a shot. Dan Danton. Yes, it was Georges Jacques Danton to his Danton. executioner at the guillotine. <coughs> and Scott James, see that Yule gets star billing. He has earned it. Yule is Y U L. Y U L? Mm. See that Yule gets star billing. He's earned it. Only think of your Brenner, the yes. only person I've well, heard of. Go on, think about him. It's a very good thing. All his di dying words are yeah. spurious. What I people so. really say is... Uh, uh. Mm. <laughs> 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 All right, half a mark for getting Brenner attached to you. Well, that was fairly easy. It's Gertrude Lawrence, speaking of your Brenner, who was appearing with her in The King and I. All right, Frank Muir. <laughs> I thank the guiding providence and fortune of my life, first, that I was born a man and a Greek, not a barbarian or a brute, 
and next, that I happen to live in the age of Socrates. Well, I'll tell you something about him. <laughs> he was a Greek. <laughs> he wasn't a barbarian. And he lived round about the time of Socrates. <laughs> Plato? Plato. Yes. Plato it is. Ha <laughs> <laughs> We come now to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the team <coughs> earlier on in the programme. So, first of all, for two marks, Dillis Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation? It's a long way to Tipperary. The popular song of the period of the First World War. Yes, that's perfectly true. What about the authors? I haven't the faintest idea. Um, but it was written <laughs> on a pop popular belief by Harold Williams and Jack Judge, but there is a rival claimant. But the actual chorus of the, It's a Long Way to Tipperary was claimed by Alice Smythe B.J., who was an American, but it became the theme song of the British Army in the First World War. And Scott James now, the origin of your quotation, Fair laughs the morn, and soft the zephyr blows. Um, is it the same poet as the lowing herd one, yes. slowly o'er the lee? Quite right. Uh, Gray. Yes, Thomas Gray. That's good enough. Well, now I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to tell me their explanation of how the quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation gets the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back first to Frank Muir and with his quotation, It's a Long Way to Tipperary. I said it this evening, uh, just a couple of minutes before the show, actually. I was coming through the, the entrance hall uh, carrying something and the commissioner on the gate said, um, uh, what's that you've got there? It's a pair of braces, isn't it? Painted mauve and starched stiff. I said, no, it's not that. It's a... Then I said this line, you see. Um, why this came about was that last week I was strolling home and I was strolling along around the back of Charing Cross there, as is my will. <laughs> and um, I... I felt suddenly hungry and paused at a cafe, as is my wound. <laughs> um, the, I remember the cafe. It's rather a downtrodden-looking place with an effort at modernity because above the cafe it said simply in rather sort of elongated modern letters, Tons Cafe, T-O-N-S, Cafe. So I pushed the door open, which went ping, <coughs> and there was a counter there with some moth-eaten sandwiches and one of those coffee urns where the brass shows through the chromium like bare flesh. <laughs> and a very lugubrious, weary-looking man behind. So I said, good evening, my good man. <laughs> Am I addressing Tun? <laughs> of Tun's Cafe? He said, no, 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 actually the name's Tony. <laughs> he said, but there was a, a Y outside, you see, and it dropped off. <laughs> so everybody, I'm going to put it up one of these days. I'm going to cut a bit of ply, you know, a bit of hard board or ply, and I'm going to cut a Y and I'm going to stick it up. But it, it's so tiring, you know, this job here. We get uh, people in and out here two or three a day, and it's, <laughs> it's all go, and I'm... It's a very weary and tired job, and he, he leant against the counter. I felt terribly sorry for him, a great lined face he had, violin-shaped, all sorts of bumps and wrinkles, like, like a relief map of Sardinia. From the side. And, and I said, uh, very good, my man, I'll have a, a, a cup of your best coffee and a cupcake. And he walked across to my table with it. A terrible, slow walk. It was awful to see. He didn't sort of use his feet as feet. He sort of walked on the ends of his legs, sort of pushing his feet in front of him, like sort of two great black haddocks. It was a... He, he put the coffee down, and I had my cupcake, and I went home... And this morning, I woke up and suddenly realised with horror that I'd paid him, but I hadn't left a tip. And then I had an inspiration. I would give him something as a gratuity, which would 
ease this weariness, ease the labour of his life. I would give him a why to put up on his sign so that no longer would he, would he just be Tun, he'd be Tony again. So I got my pair of braces and I starched them till they were rigid and I painted them mauve because it was a mauve sign. And they were, they were nice and thin and narrow, they suited the sign. And I was carrying those in this evening when the commissioner said, hello, what you got there? Is that a pair of braces painted mauve and starts in yellow? I said, no, it isn't that at all. You know what it is? It's a long way to tip a weary. <laughs> nightmares about those feet. <laughs> and we now go on to Dennis Norton, and if you remember his quotation was, Fair laughs the morn, and soft the zephyr blows. By Thomas Gray. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Astonished. Fair laughs the morn, and soft the zephyr blows is the actual text of a telegram which I sent to Frank Muir, which actually got him his present job at BBC Television. You see, what had happened was, when they offered him the job, he was very keen on it, but he was w very worried about one thing. So you have to pass various tests whenever you join the staff of the BBC, and he wasn't worried about the loyalty test, because that's terribly easy. You know, you sort of face a thing of Richard Dimbleby, and you swear that you will serve the BBC faithfully, and be clean in thought, word, and deed, and you won't sell any of the my word answers to Red China, and you always need the executive wash basins you'd wish to find. That, that was easy enough. What he was worried about was the physical, you see, because he had an idea that he wouldn't pass the eyesight test, because he actually is a bit short-sighted. And he said to me, what am I going to do? He said, because I'll never read that eye chart that you have to read. He said, I, I can do the first two lines, but I know I'll fail on the third line. So I said to him, well, when is your appointment with this oculist? And he said, 11 o'clock Friday. I said, well, look, fair enough. I'll go there Thursday evening. I'll read the third line, and I'll phone you up and tell you what it is, and you can memorise it when you go along there Friday morning. He said, OK. So I went along, and I read this third line in the eye chart, and made a note of it, and it's actually F-L-T-M-A-S-T-Z-B, you see, and I read this, and made a note of it, and immediately rushed round to phone Frank, and I phoned him and couldn't get any reply. Suddenly I thought, I know what I'll do, I'll send him a telegram. So I went straight into the post office, and I just did this short, you know, on one of these telegraph forms, Dear Frank, F-L-T-M-A-S-T-Z-B, best regards, cheeky. And the post office clerk took this, and he said, I'm very sorry, sir. He said, but I cannot send this. And I said, well, find somebody who can. You know, <laughs> you know thinking that he'd got his, his Morse code machine finger sprained, you know, because it's, it's a very easy finger to sprain. And he said, no, sir, he said, I, I cannot send this because we cannot send code messages. So I said, well, no, that's not code, F L T M A S. TZZB. He said, well, what is it? And of course, I couldn't tell him, you see. So I said, well, it's, um, it's a Greek. It's a Greek word, actually. It's uh, flutamastaba. Um, flutamastaba is a, is a very well-known Greek word. You, you've heard about the, the Greeks had a word for it. Well, that is the word they had for it. And he said, you intend to use the post office telegram to you to send obscene Greek messages. I said, no, 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 I said, no, no, my good man. It was a habit I picked up from Frank calling people my good man. I said, um, no, not, not at all. I said, flum mastered, but it's, it's actually a uh, Greek message, which means um, everything is good and fine. Will you be my valentine? <laughs> So he said, you are sending a valentine to a gentleman called Frank Muir? <laughs> so I said, well, you know, he, it's Frank Muir is what he's known as. You know, his name is actually Frankopolis Muropopolis. <laughs> <laughs> 
And he said, he receives valentines from other gentlemen. He said, I'll get on to the BBC. I said, no, don't bother, please. Please don't bother. And I rushed out and thought, what the devil can I do? How can I send these letters to Frank? By... And I suddenly had a marvellous idea. I went into a grocer's shop and I asked for a packet of detergent and I swallowed a mouthful of it and then I remembered in my mind the complete works of Thomas Gray. Because this is, was the, that detergent that forces Gray out, you see. <laughs> and, and I... I thought, I know how I'll send F-L-T-M-A-S-T-Z-B to Frank. I merely sent him a telegram saying, Frank Muir, please use the initials of following quotation, fair laughs the morn and soft the zephyr blows. I couldn't see how he could possibly work around to tell us Gray, but he did in the end. <laughs> now, this uh, makes an extremely interesting result in which the stories result in an exact draw. They had exactly the same amount of applause from the theatre audience, and I think they well deserved it. And it also brings us to a final score in which Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, nevertheless, win by three marks from Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, and this also brings us to the end of this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason, and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Round one tries to test their vocabulary, respectively. Two marks if they get the meanings of these words approximately right. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Anne, what is a crampon? C-R-A-M-P-O-N. <coughs> Something to do with mountain climbing, isn't yes, it? Yes, you're jolly good. Now, is it the thing, that, the sort of crutchy leg bit? What would you think? <laughs> or the thing you either you, you sort of heave yourself. I would never climb a mountain with a crutchy leg. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is it the thing walk. you attach to your mountain boots? Yes, or is it come the on, thing come, that's come right, on the that, thing yeah, you yeah. attach to your mountain Why? boots? Well, so as to get a better grip on the icy side of the mountain. That's well done, Anne. That's a beautiful um, definition. <laughs> <laughs> it's a frame of spikes fitted to a boot for walking on ice or steep snow with eight, ten, or twelve points. It can also mean, before it was adopted by the mountaineers, a metal hook or a grappling iron, but yours is the up to date explanation. Two marks. And Frank Muir. The meaning of the word lancinating, L-A-N-C-I-N-A-T-I-N-G, lancinating. Uh, yes, the verb. Yep. Lancinating. 
Anything to do with lancing, as in medical matters? Yes. Deboiling. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no boil, only toil. <laughs> um, one lancinates one's lobe. Yes. If one wishes um, an earring to depend therefrom. <laughs> I think uh, you creep home with two there, just about. It's pain, which is piercing and stabbing, acute and shooting, from a Latin word which means to rend, so that when Frank next wears his <laughs> pierced earrings, that's roughly it. All right, two. Not with my tweeds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dennis Powell. The meaning of the word lambent, L-A-M-B-E-N-T, lambent. Well, it's kind of, uh, kind of flickering of, of a flame. Yes. It has a particular quality. Um, it's a poetic kind of thing, isn't yes, it? Yes, lambent flame. Sort of intermittent flame. No, one out of two. Um, it is a flame or a light. It comes from a Latin word meaning to lick with flame. But the point is it plays on the surface of whatever it is playing on without burning it. It's a sort of soft kind of radiance. It doesn't burn it all up, all in one. Mm. And poetically... Uh, a lambent eye, or, or the lambent sky, means it's softly radiant without hurting. Yes. Dennis Norton. Dennis, what is a uh, Hamlet? Not just Hamlet, a uh, Hamlet. Is it uh, a? Yes. Oh, I see. <laughs> Sounds like an ejaculation. A <laughs> um, uh, Hamlet is... Well, there's all sorts of things. A uh, Hamlet is a um, uh, little melancholy day. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little village. Yeah. Or in America they have a... It's a ham omelette. <laughs> so Hamlet, only the uh is done with an American accent. I'll give you two mm. before, before you go on any further. I want it, to creep home with two. Yeah, like two no, no, you're not creep home. You, you can come creep triumph, home with triumphantly with two. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small village, especially one without a church, too small for a church, and comes from an old English word meaning home. Well, before we begin round two, I give um, each team a quotation for them to write down, and I want the two women members of the team to study their quotations, and then at the end, I shall ask the two teams, women members, for the source of the quotations. And Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, here's your quotation. All power is a trust, and we are accountable for its exercise. And then Dennis Power with Frank Miller. Yours is, I am myself indifferent, honest. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their ideas of how these words came to be said or to be written. And so on to round two. And this is a round of pet names. From what names are the following pet names derived? <laughs> Anne Scott James, to begin. Amy. Emily? No. Nope. Oh, come off it. Or Emma. Emma. It's Emma. Nope. It's a fine old name. <laughs> Jemima. <laughs> <laughs> no, it won't do. Amy? I don't see that there Amelia. is any... Amelia. Yes, two marks for Amelia. Amy short for Amelia. Um, Frank Muir, mercy. It, it's French. Um, thank you. Short. <laughs> <laughs> the surname is beaucoup. <laughs> short for Mercedes. All right. <laughs> mercy is normally short for Mercedes, but it is in fact a name on its own by itself, thanks to sort of puritanical tradition of naming girls according to the cardinal Christian virtues. Mm. So there you are. Dillis Powell. Maud. Magdalene. <clears throat> That's a nice idea. It's and I think a I would give idea. you some of the marks for it, but yes. the normal derivation is Matilda. Thank you, Jack. No, then it's not. Kit. Kit Marlowe was, was um, yeah. Christopher. Yes, Christopher it is. Two marks. That was fairly <clears throat> easy when I thought. And so to a roundabout verse and poetry, um, rhymes that we learnt or tried to learn when we were very young. Uh, I don't want the names of the authors um, because most of these are anonymous or traditional rhymes, but up to three marks as a maximum if you can go on as long as you can go on completing these verses. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Monday's child is fair of face, Tuesday's child is full of grace, 
Wednesday's child is full of woe. Well, Thursday's child has far to go. Yes. Um, Friday's child has is loving and no. Yes. It's loving and giving. Saturday's yep. child has to work for its living. That's me. I was born on a Saturday. Um, but the child that is born on the Sabbath day is happy and wise and good and gay. Yes. Yes. Great. Three marks absolutely spent. She knows well, it. Well, <laughs> now, Frank Moore. And listen carefully, Frank. One, two, buckle my shoe. <laughs> uh, three, four, open the door. No. Five, six, pick up, pick up the sticks. Seven, eight, open the gate. <laughs> Nine, ten, dirty fat head. <laughs> I think you had a very disturbed childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Um, two and a half, I think, out of three. What's yours, then? Come on. Ah, I'll give it to you, yes. One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four. And then there are two versions of the next line. You both got both wrong. It's either knock at the door or shut the door, but it isn't open the door. <laughs> uh, five, six, pick up sticks. Seven, eight, lay them straight. Nine, ten. The seven, eight what? Seven, eight, lay them straight. You have oh. to with sticks. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you get a most terrible muddle in your backyard. Um, <laughs> nine, ten, a big fat hen, or it could be a good fat hen. So two and a half, I think, would be fair. All right, on to Dillis Powell. Little Polly Flinders sat among the cinders. I had, is, I really had a very underprivileged childhood. I <laughs> she got bashed for getting her clothes it. dirty. Get that into rhyme. Yeah. Her mum came in and whipped her for getting her clothes dirty. Yeah. Little Polly Finger. If I had a skipping rope, I could do it. So <laughs> <laughs> give Dennis a skipping rope and try. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I, I'm shocked at this, as you don't yeah. know this. You couldn't have a childhood. No, no, no. What, what happened to your It was very daughter? underprivileged. I was working in a blacking factory with Dick. Right. Um, <laughs> Frank, go back to... <laughs> a browning <laughs> would have been more suitable. <laughs> go back to the bit that you did, which was quite right. Um, because she was got a new dress and yes. she, she was, oh. uh, got it all Cindy and cinders and yeah. ash all over it and... Uh, it, it, it doesn't scan, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's approximately what the sense is about, and I will give you one mark out of three for that. Um, little Polly Flinders sat among the cinders, warming her pretty little toes. Her mother came and caught her and whipped her little daughter for spoiling of her nice new clothes. You gave had... her a bash for, because <laughs> of the ash. <laughs> Dillis, you either had too many nice new clothes or none at all. I wouldn't know none which. None at all, no, in that blacking factory. They never gave me any. <laughs> all right, back to Dennis Norton. Dennis, this is the farmer sowing his corn that kept the cock that crowed in the morn, that waked the priest all shaven and shorn, that married the man all tattered and torn. Oh, there's a heck of a lot that goes on <laughs> before you finally arrive at the house that Jack built. Yes, that's it. Including, including a cow with a crumpled horn. Yes. The man is a man all tattered and torn. Yes. And he did... Yeah. Very with a cow with a crumpled horn. <laughs> what am I doing with this alien corn? <laughs> <laughs> the house that Jack built. <laughs> Yes, I don't, you hardly qualify yet, Dennis. Oh, he beat the maiden all for lawn. Yes. That's right, yes. yes that's right, yeah. go on with that. Who milked the crow, cow with the crump of Quite horn. right, well done, Anne. Come on, now. Yes, and what did the cow do? I think the cow's gone. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, <coughs> thanks to yes. Anne's help. We meet at dawn. One, <laughs> one and a half, you've got two out of the six lines. This is the farmer sowing his corn that kept the cock that crowed in the morn that waked the priest all shaven and shorn that married the man all tattered and torn that kissed the maiden all forlorn that milked the cow with a crumpled horn that tossed the dog that worried the cat that killed the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. <laughs> now we have a nice classical round of mythology and two marks for correct answers. And Scott James, what was the Minotaur? Oh, the Minotaur lived in the middle of the labyrinth in Crete, and yes. he was a bull-headed monster. Yes. Who um, had a tribute. Habits? Maids. Oh, habits, he devoured youths and maidens yes. sent from the mainland of Greece. His habits were nasty. <laughs> Do you want more? 
mean, the no, that's absolutely The spin. bull vaulting, the people used to have to <laughs> vault on his back, <laughs> all in Mary Renault. Yes, quite, quite right, Dennis. I'm glad you mentioned that. There's a lovely book about it by Mary Renault, The King Must Die, uh, relating it all to bullfighting. But this was a, a monster, half man and half bull, the offspring of the Queen, Pasiphae, and a bull, kept in the labyrinth at Crete, at Knossos, and eventually killed by Theseus with the help of Ariadne. Two marks. Frank Muir, <coughs> who was Androcles, and why is he remembered? If I can't answer the second one, I can't answer the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Androcles was a slave, yes. and he was um, in the woods, and there was this lion, and the lion had a thorn in his paw. Poor little lion, had a, <laughs> a nasty old thorn in his paw. And Androcles bravely took the thorn out of the lion's pad, and uh, then years pass. And then uh, something happens to Androcles which escapes my memory. It was irrelevant at the moment. And he's flung into the arena in Rome uh, to be eaten by a lion. And a lion bounds out of a cage, released, and eats him because it's a different lion. (laughs) (laughs) That story has been corrupted to give it a happy ending. (laughs) Well... Uh, because you know the happy ending, <laughs> in common with George Bernard Shaw, <laughs> I'll give you your two marks. Uh, Dillis, Dillis Bauer, who was Vulcan and who were his assistants? Vulcan was a kind of um, underworld character. Yes. Who uh, had a forge. Yes, quite right. And um, he was a god and he had a bellows. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And his assistants. His assistants. This is rather more difficult. This is very difficult. I, he was called Hephaestus in Greek. The what? He was called. <laughs> he, he was called Hephaestus. Yes, like Hephaestus absolutely right. Greek. Yes, yes. He was the god of fire. Um, he was also god of the working of metals. And as Dillis quite rightly says, he he worked there at his forge. The forge and the workshop were on Mount Etna, and his assistants were the one-eyed Cyclops, and they forged or helped him to forge Jove's thunderbolts. Um, Two marks. All right, Dennis Dorden. Who was Cassandra? Um, She was the daughter of parents. (laughs) Priam. Priam, that's it. Well done. Who were Greek, yes. Greek parents, and she... Trojan. Trojan parents. What am I talking? Trojan parents. King, King Priam of Troy. Yes. And then... But she had this rather dicey do with this um, god who came down and, and um, they, they had it better than anybody, the gods, because they could turn anybody to anything or give them any sort of reward they wanted. And he said that I will give you the gift of prophecy if. <laughs> so she... <laughs> well, the point is she didn't, you yeah. see. And... She had the gift of prophecy already given her, as it were. So then he got very angry about it and said, well, I'll give you the gift of prophecy, but nobody will take any notice of it. Yes. So she went round at all the parties sort of prophesying. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. And she was a drag because nobody... <laughs> and she just it was always unhappy. She never prophesied no good things are going to happen. There was always bad things, and nobody took any notice of her. Absolutely right. It's so, a bu- I don't know, so I think she joined a tennis club or something. <laughs> It's a good description of the Sandler learning. story, and you get two marks for it, Dennis. Um, she got the gift of prophecy, and she was fated to prophesy truly and always to be disbelieved. She was the girl who said, don't bring that whacking great wooden horse inside the walls. And they said, what, people inside a horse? <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> well, now we come to the last round. And go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier on in the programme. <laughs> So, beginning with Anne Scott James, Anne, can you give me the origin of your quotation, which was, all power is a trust, and we are accountable for its exercise? I think this was Disraeli. Quite right. Two marks you get, Anne. Now, Dillis Power, the origin of yours, which was, I am myself indifferent, honest. Shakespeare. Yes. Hamlet. Yes. Who's speaking? Hamlet. 
Yes? <laughs> I can't fault you. There's two marks. It's Hamlet talking to poor Ophelia. Oh, In the speech begins, get thee to a nunnery, why shouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? Now, now I'm going to ask uh, Frank and Dennis to tell me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever unlikely explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. Um, so, back to Dennis Norton and his quotation, all power is a trust and we are accountable for its exercise. Well, I've just been disqualified from driving <laughs> on account of Dillis Powell. <laughs> you see, we do a lot of these programmes from Birmingham and the rest of us go up by car, but Dillis always goes up by train because she has this strange sort of quirk that she can only travel with her back to the way she's going. <laughs> well, apparently there are lots of people like this, and it's puzzling, you know, and I've, I've had lots of, sort of chats with her about it. And you mean that whatever you're in, you can only travel with your back to the way you're going? And she said, yes. And I said, well, what are you doing in a lift? <laughs> <You know. clears throat> this whole thing... <clears throat> boiled up rather considerably a few weeks ago, three weeks ago, when we were in Birmingham, and Dillis missed the last train. <laughs> Dillis came to me in a terrible state and said, what, what can I do? She said, I, I've missed the last train and I must get back to London tomorrow morning to keep fit. <laughs> um, and I said, oh, well, I don't know how you're going to get back um, unless I drive you, you see. And I had this brilliant idea this brilliant idea that eventually led to me standing in this police court <laughs> while the clerk of the court read out the charges dangerous driving, driving without due care and attention, driving without consideration, conduct unbecoming to an... you know the... <laughs> and I sat there and up got this policeman this motorcyclist, this motorcycle policeman and this rather smart lady solicitor. He said, well, sir, he said that at uh, 10.20 last night, I was proceeding down the M1 when I saw this gent doing 45 miles per hour. And the magistrate said, well, I think that's quite suitable on the M1. And she said he was in reverse. <laughs> Now, there was a sort of sensation in court at this, and the police constable went back and sat at the table where the lady solicitor sat, and she just sort of sat there looking triumphant and rubbing her leg against his. You know. <laughs> and, um, the policeman, the, the magistrate said to me, why did you do this? What led you to go down the M1 in reverse at 45 miles an hour? Is it, is it something psychological? I mean, were you a, a backward child? You know? And... I explained, I told him why, and I said it was to help Miss Dillis Pearl, the distinguished film critic, and she can only travel if she's got her back to the way she's going, you see? And this is why I, I did it, sir. He said, I think, I think any one of us would have done this if it had meant that Dillis Pearl would have been fit to get to her keep fit class. <laughs> and I thought I got away with it. But up stood this legal bird. <laughs> And she said, did it not occur to you, Mr. Norton, that instead of turning your car round the other way, you could have turned Miss Dillis Powell round the other way? <laughs> well, there was a big hush. <laughs> and something ugly and rather hostile ran through the court. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> I wasn't having it. I, I, of course, I, I got off the driving charge, but I got my driving licence taken away for hitting a lady solicitor with a registration book. <laughs> but I'm glad. I'm still glad I did it. I'm still glad that I enabled Dillis to get to her keep fit class, because though Disraeli may have said that all power is a trust and we are accountable for its exercise, I think Dill Powell is a trust and we are accountable for her exercise. <laughs> All right.
right back to Frank Muir, and if you'll remember, his quotation was, I am myself indifferent honest. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story which will finish with the words, I am myself indifferent honest. It concerns a camel driver called myself, who, <laughs> who has a camel which has a harness, and the camel dies, and he has to wear the harness and pull the, the things, and there, there are several different harnesses, and I'll end up with this, with this line. Now, um, I believe in doing things in an orderly, regular fashion, and uh, I will talk and tell you this story, and then I will say the line, and then I want you to applaud. <laughs> now, uh, be quiet, please. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll upset the timing. Now, I will time myself um, on my watch, which I have in my sock. <laughs> I, as you see, I always have my wristwatch. <laughs> I always have my wristwatch in my sock. The reason I carry it in my sock rather than on my wrist, which is normal, is that the watch also tells the time, the date. Besides the time, it also gives me the date. Now, when I'm signing a check in a shop or something and can't remember the date, when I look at my watch, people snigger and I say, I can't remember the date and look at my watch. They think I'm just being silly. But if I bend down and fiddle with my sock uh, and just see the date, you see, nobody takes the slightest bit of attention. That's why I wear... And the, you notice that the watch was in my left sock. There's a reason for that, too. I never wear a right sock. <laughs> you see, I always walk sideways because the... They talk about the roads getting cluttered up with traffic, but the pavements are just as cluttered with pedestrians. And it's because, if you think about it, the one is much wider across the shoulders than one is, as, as it were, in depth. So if everybody walks sideways, we'd all be able to pass each other. It's quite easy, so I always walk um, sideways along the pavement. And, of course, you can't cross your legs in walking, as one does normally. One just sort of brings one foot up to the other, then pushes the other one away and brings it up. So one doesn't need, really, to have two trouser legs. I discovered if you have one voluminous trouser leg... It's not... Oh, I'm sorry, my time's up. So, um, I'm afraid uh, my story has come to an end, and I haven't uh, been able to do, uh, bring in the line. But I'm sure you appreciate that, from my point of view, it's better to finish the story in an orderly fashion, in the pros proscribed time, than to, uh, th to fulfil the requirements of art. I, I, I know that um, it may mean that Dallas and I will lose the round, <laughs> and we've lost quite a lot of these rounds. <laughs> it may mean that we are removed from the programme, <laughs> and I have to sell the children, and... <laughs> And my wife has to beg, and uh, Dillis has to go back to being an usherette at the Isoldo. <laughs> uh, but these, these arguments don't obtain with me. I mean, uh, the arguments like that may affect Dillis, they may affect my wife, but not me. So that sort of argument, I am myself indifferent, honest. <laughs> I hope to see Frank walking sideways in one trouser leg. <laughs> well, that brings to an end the contest of the stories, which Dennis Norton, by your vote, wins. It also brings us to a final score in which um, Anne Scott James and Dennis have done frightfully well and won by eight marks this time from Dillis Powell and Frank Muir. And that also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. Thank you.
The BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Round one tries to test their vocabulary. They get two marks if they get the following words roughly right. Beginning with Dillis Powell, a rather long word, Dillis. What is a galactophagist? G-A-L-A-C-T-O-P-H-A-G-I-S-T. Galactophagist. Uh, it's somebody who eats something. Yes, true. Well, well yes, uh, in a manner of speaking. He like consumes it. it. Yes. Yes, he consumes milk. That'll do. A, a baby. baby. <laughs> <laughs> or even a very small calf. That would do. Yes. It blew up. A person who lives on milk or milk products only. It doesn't mean somebody who's trying to eat the Milky Way. Um, two marks. Dennis Norton. What is the Skuptishina? S-K-U-P-S-H-T-I-N-A. Well. So, well, it's... fine old Yugoslav word, yes? don't you think? You're quite right. Oh. I would never have known that, no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Yugoslavian word. Yes. You, can, you can finish it all from there. It's a Yugoslavian concertina that's been caught in a mechanical scoop. <laughs> um, um, well, it's a Yugoslavian uh, person, dress... Or musical instrument. Or musical instrument. No. Or female. No. Female. No, 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 this is a, an institution rather than any of the things you've quoted. I'll give you one out of two for knowing it's Yugoslav. It's the Yugoslav Parliament, a Serbian word meaning assembly. Oh. Now, Anne Scott James, what are Atlantes? A T L A N T E S, Atlantes. Oh, something to do with this derives from Atlas, yes. doesn't it? Um, who held up the world. Yeah. I think they're the architectural figures, the men who held up buildings. Quite right. Absolutely dead right. These are sculptured male figures who serve as pillars opposite to those women who sometimes do it, who are called caryatids. So you're absolutely dead right. Now, Atlas originally bore the earth on his shoulders. Two marks. Well done, Anne. Frank Miller, what is a parang? P-A-R-A-N-G. A parang? Mm. In the Royal Air Force. <laughs> it was what happened when a Perlane crashed. <laughs> <coughs> it was a Parang. <laughs> yes, it's um, a Meshit. Yes. yes. Uh, with the sharp end the other way. Uh, that sounds to me more like a cookery, but I think you're very nearly there. Um, where would you wear it, Frank? Wear it mm. at your side <laughs> in All the right, belt. I, I give up. I give you two marks. It's a heavy Malayan sheath knife. Well, before we begin round two, I, I'm going to give each team a quotation for them to write down. And the two women <coughs> members of the team will, I hope, study those quotations because at the end of the program, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. So, Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, here's yours. I moved my lips, the pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit. And at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. We go on to a round of Shakespearean quotations, a maximum of three marks, if members of the team can complete the following quotations and give the source they come from. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Had I but served my God with half the zeal, I served my king. Said by Wolsey, isn't yes. it? Yes. Said by Wolsey and Henry VIII. Yep. Can you complete it? Um, with half the zeal, I served my king. I don't really think that I can get it very accurately. No. Wolsey said it to Cromwell, who was the up-and-coming chap, in Shakespeare's Henry VIII, and it goes... Had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies. End of the long speech, beginning of farewell of long farewell to all my greatness. Dennis Norton. 
What is the opinion of Pythagoras concerning wild fowl? <laughs> That's the bit in Twelfth Night yes. where Malvolio, towards the end, where Mal they, they, um, pretending Malvolio is out of his mind. Yes. And one of the chaps dresses up as a curate. Yes, quite right. And sort of gives him these send-up questions, mm -hmm. which he makes uh, ineffective answers. What do you answer to this? I can't remember. Um, well, certainly two out of three. That's a good answer, Dennis. Um, it's the clown in Twelfth Night speaking to Malvolio, who's been shut up in a cell because they think he's <coughs> gone mad for mm -hmm. trying to make love to Olivia, the countess. Mm -hmm. What is the opinion of Pythagoras concerning wild fowl? And Malvolio re re replies with... Uh, a great sort of pomposity, that the soul of our granddam might haply inhabit a bird. And then the clown asks again, what thinkest thou of, this, of his opinion? And Malvolio replies, I think nobly of the soul and no way approve his opinion. Um, a good two, Dennis, on it, I think. And Scott James, yet I should kill thee with much cherishing. I should think that's Romeo and Juliet, yes. is it? Yes. Yet I should kill thee with much, much cherishing. cherishing. Can't finish. One, I think, this time. Good night, good night. Parting is such sweet, sweet sorrow, sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Frank Muir, this green plot shall be our stage. Oh, yes, this is the, uh, this is the rude mechanic. Yes. Assembling uh, to rehearse Permis and Thisbe. It's almost the beginning of the scene which goes now... Here is a marvellous, convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot should be our stage, this Hawthorne break our tiring house, and we should perform the play as we should perform it before the Duke. Well done. Do you remember who said it? Mr. Bottom. What say yourself, Peter, Peter Quince? Bully Bottom. <laughs> no, it's it, it starts off, um, um, how we all met, Pat. Yeah. Pat. <laughs> 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 this is a marvellous thing. Uh, three, absolutely. I wish I could give it's you by a William bird. Shakespeare, another mark. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd give you a bonus mark. Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Peter Quince, talking to his rude mechanical friends, as uh, Frank quite rightly says, as they begin to rehearse their wonderful production of Pyramus and Thisbe. Well, the next round is Origins and Derivations. Three marks, if members of the team can get the present meanings right, and then give me the origin and derivation of these words or phrases or expressions. Beginning with Dillis Powell. The sands are running out. It means the time is getting short. Yes. And I should think it came from a, a using a, an hourglass. Yes, that's all I think one needs to say. Three marks. Well done. Dennis Norton, to kiss the place and make it better. Kiss the place and make it better. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> well, it's what you tell a child mm. when he's hurt. Yes. And it fools them up to about the age of 17. <laughs> <laughs> and the derivation? Yeah. I don't know. <coughs> I know a story about a fellow who was going hunting in Africa and he went to his doctor and said, what do I do if I get bitten by a snake? And the doctor said, well, you get somebody to kiss the place and make it better. And he said, well, suppose... I get bitten in a very embarrassing place. <laughs> well, the doctor said, that's when you find out who your real friends are. <laughs> well, in terms of that irrelevant and slightly improper story, Dennis has got it entirely right, and I'm going to give you three marks. <laughs> uh, but it does derive from the days when sorcerers and uh, witch doctors and healers impressed people with the strength of the magic powers they had by affecting to kiss a snake bite to make it better and actually if they sucked hard at the poison quite likely it worked and scott james a grass widow well a grass widow means a woman whose husband is away so that she's not strictly a widow because she's her husband's still alive mm -hmm. and not not divorced yes fair enough yes and uh, by origin grass widow grass you know, they must have put them out to grass. Yes, that's hard. Right. Oh. Oh, history. Yes, it means when you're tired of some animal, yes. you just put it, turn it out to grass. It's ah. rather, rather pathetic. Yeah. Um, all right. 
uh, near enough. Um, a woman who is temporarily separated from her husband, though not divorced, and it comes from the custom of Europeans in India sending their wives up to the hills, the cool hills, during the hot season when the poor husbands had to remain behind in the very um, parched cities working hard. And it may be because up in the mountains the grass grew greener, whereas down the plains it was desert. Or it may be, as Dennis has suggested, this was like putting a horse out at grass, out to grazing, out of work, making holiday while somebody else did all the work. Frank no. Lumber room. It means a room full of old junk. Yes. And originally? It means a room full of older junk. <laughs> Antiques. Right. Yeah. But why? Why lumber? Well, because the room is usually at the back of the house, which is the lumber region. Oh. The medical. <laughs> <laughs> lumber jack is timber. Yes. Lumber room, because it's full of um, timber. No, I think uh, you've got the right meaning of the present, but I don't think you've got the origin, which I think is rather difficult. Um, one out of three, I think, is right. Uh, any, a room in which all the family junk is put, as Frank said rightly. But it is a corruption, a lumber room, of Lombard room. The Lombards were the first and original pawnbrokers in England, and therefore their rooms got terribly cluttered up with other people's possessions, whether they'd forgotten about them or couldn't redeem them or what not. And so Lombard room came to mean a room full of all sorts of articles, junk of this kind. Nonsense. And from Lombard Room, it became Lumber Room. It's marvellous, actually. I think it's much better to say, you know, where's that? It's in our Lombard Room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I intend it's always to use terrible, it in the future. filthy, dusty place full of old mattresses. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. The next round is a very difficult round of nicknames. Two marks if you get them right. And Dillis Powell, who was Achilles of England? Wellington. Yeah, this is absolutely right. Dennis Norton, who was Cock of the North? The railway train. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It is a railway train. Actually, it's also the, the, what they call the billing of a very good Scottish music hall comedian called Peter Sinclair. I think I'd say he was Cock of the North, yes. One out of two. Yes, Largely because of the railway <laughs> engine, which I think was jolly good. But the railway engine itself was named after George Gordon, the fifth Duke of Gordon, who raised the Gordon Highlanders in 1795. Neves Cock of the North. And Scott James, who was Copper-Nosed Harry? Oh. <laughs> so right when you said they were, these were difficult. I think they are, yeah. What's the date of this? You um, very early 16th century or late 15th century. I've forgotten my date. Early 16th century? I think early 16th century is fair enough, yes. Early 16th, I always have to remember that, means Harry. 1500 and something, isn't it? Yeah. Was it Henry? Henry yes. VIII? Yes. Oh, <laughs> nonsense. Yes. Well, yes. this is Les Majestés. Yes. That's I've never figure. heard him refer to him. No, nor have I. Who any called odd, him that? odd nickname, they always leave it to Henry VIII, don't they? They always yes, bestow they it on yeah. Henry VIII. It was Henry VIII. When he'd overspent his inheritance, he brought in a new coinage in the form of a very inferior silver coin, which had a copper yeah. alloy base. So the silver wore off, the copper showed through, and it showed through particularly and rather embarrassingly on the face of the king on the coinage, and particularly on the nose, which is about the most prominent object. So you use copper, nose, carry. Uh, half out of two. Well, it might come in useful sometimes. <laughs> You'll find you're stuck with a crossword puzzle that says Henry VIII, C-O, blank, blank, E-R, nose, carry. <laughs> It'll help. Frank Muir, who was Soapy Sam? It's also Henry. <coughs> there's, a, uh, there's a Victorian preacher. Yes. Given another hour and a half, I might get a bit closer. Because I've read about this Spurgeon. man. Hmm? I think that's Spurgeon. jolly good getting as far as you did. Sam smiles. Spurgeon. I think you get one and a half for knowing he was a Victorian preacher, which seems to me jolly hard to know. It was Bishop Wilberforce of Oxford, <sighs> 1805 to 1873, a very unctuous way of speaking and preaching. And then we have around initials and abbreviations. Two marks, what do or did the following stand for? Dois Powell, CMB. CMB? CMB. Commander, company, no. council, no. Uh, commodore, no, captain. You're getting into the right element. Commodore. Um, commodore. Captain. No, no. Captain no. Motorboats. Com commodore. CMB. <laughs> 
captain of motorboats. Not captain. Command of motorboats. <laughs> Coastal motorboats. That's it. Ah. You got there at last. All right. <laughs> Two marks. Um, CMV is Coastal Motorboat, or it can be certificated by the Central Midwives Board. <laughs> I hope none of you will ever be. Yeah. <coughs> it's terrible to be posted there when you join up. <laughs> <laughs> Sending you to CMB. <laughs> Dennis Norton, I think this is an easy, easy one for you. GCA. Oh, this, oh, this is the aeroplane. Yes. Thing when you talk down. Ground, ground control approach. Quite right. Two marks. Well done. And Scott James. I.E. It is. Meaning? That is. Well done. Two marks. Hank Miller, PMH. N-O. <laughs> PMH. PMH. Per miles, hour. <laughs> Post mistresses, hours. <laughs> Before you get on dangerous ground, I'm going to say you don't know. No marks. It's production per man, hour. Oh, too penis. many words. <laughs> PP. <laughs> too many words, not enough production. Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're back to the midwives. <laughs> And now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the two teams earlier on the programme. So first, most powerful, for two marks, can you give me the origin of your quotation, the proof of the pudding is in the eating? I was thought just a proverb. Yes, it comes out of John Ray's book of proverbs, written in the 16th century, though of course it may have occurred a good deal earlier. Now, Anne Scott James, the origin of yours, which was, I moved my lips, the pilot shrieked, and fell down in a fit. And this is the ancient mariner, I think. Yes. A Coleridge. Two marks. And I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. And so, back to Frank Muir with his quotation, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. <clears throat> the proof of the pudding is in the eating. That's why I was almost late for the show, because I had to go and buy this, this um, I think they're called pitch pipes, thing you blow down and get a musical note, you see. Otherwise, um, I didn't know whether I was right or wrong in this thing I've designed for drying my poodle's tail when she gets snowed on. <laughs> because, uh, see, I've been terribly interested in uh, looking after our dumb friends and improving their lot. When it's snowy... They get snow on them, and they will stand still and let you dry their faces and their bodies, but they won't let you dry their tail, you know, which is like a little sort of tiny palm tree. <laughs> as soon as you start rubbing their tail, they twist away. So I thought there must be a, a way, a humane way of fixing a poodle so that you can dry its tail. So I got um, a rather early photographer's developing dish, which was about three or four inches deep, and into this, I poured some of that jelly that one used to buy uh, for printing school magazines on. <laughs> Do you remember the stuff? <laughs> jelly graph things. I had to buy about four trayfuls of that. Melted it, poured it into this deep dish. Then just in front of the deep dish, I put, I hung from string from the ceiling about n a nine-inch brass tube. <coughs> Next to this, I upturned a bicycle. And on the back wheel of the bicycle, I gummed little metal hammers, which I got from old alarm clocks. <laughs> so that when you tur gently turned the pedals of the bicycle, the little hammers donged against the brass tube and went ding, 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 ding. Now, I have found that poodles respond to this, and they lean forward and, and want to sniff at it and find what makes this noise. And, of course, they step forward to push their little wet noses to find where the noise comes from. This ding, 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 and they step in the jelly with their front paws. They are held fast, and then quite easily, with an ordinary hand towel, one can dry their tails <laughs> perfectly humanely. Now, but the trouble is with poodle, and this is the odd thing, that they will only respond if it's E-natural. If it's E-sharp or E-flat, no good, they're not interested. So I had to sort of f file a bit off and make it exactly E-natural. And, of course, to get it E-natural, too, because I haven't got perfect pitch, this evening I had to go fly around all the music shops and find one of those things that you blow down and it gives you the, the note of E. In other words, it was really 
uh, I was desperately anxious. Now, I'd made my, my poodle device uh, to prove that it worked. <coughs> because if you're going to make one of these dingers to attack poodles, the proof of the pooding is in the E thing. <laughs> I always wanted to know who was the grandfather of Lewis Carroll's White Knight, and now I know it was Frank. <laughs> Back to Dennis and his quotation. I moved my lips, the pilot shrieked, and fell down in a fit. I had a very strange experience in my bath the other day. <laughs> um, I was lying there, and it struck me what an absolute waste of time it is to wash your elbows. <laughs> I ever thought that? I mean, nobody sees them. Nobody cares about them. And I, I sort of got to thinking about elbows. And that of all the pertinences, the exterior pertinences of the human body, elbows are about the most useless. Not just useless. They're ugly, too. They're all knobbly and crinkled. <laughs> and all they really do is wear out the sleeve of your jacket so you have to have a leather patch put there you know it makes a dinner jacket look absolutely rotten <laughs> and I was thinking what use are elbows and then suddenly as I thought this this strange thing happened I had a sort of vision I was suddenly transported back in time to the very dawn of history thousands, millions of years ago to the moment when the first two human beings emerged from the fish stage. I don't know if you know that when we started, all of us, we, we were fish-shaped. Everybody was fish-shaped for millions and millions of years and suddenly these couple of fish-shaped people were born sort of people-shaped. And we all come from those, from those two. Everybody comes from those. And I was sort of watching them. And, of course, life was very strange for them because they were the first two beings to have a people-shaped body, you see. And they didn't know how any of it worked or what all the bits and pieces were for, you see, having been fish-shaped and all their friends and relations having been fish-shaped. And, of course, it took them ages and ages to find out, bit by bit, you know. One day, the chap came back to the girl and said, you know what I just found we've got? And he said, what? He said, knees. <laughs> so he said, well, how did you find that out? He said, well, I was messing about with my leg. He said, I accidentally bent it. <laughs> and there's a knee. It's just the one on both of them, one on both legs. She said, well, that's marvellous. That makes life much easier, doesn't it? You see, because what they were thinking of was playing piggyback with the baby. <laughs> Because they had a baby, you see. That came as a bit of surprise. <laughs> you know, as well. He said, he said, I must tell the baby, where is the baby? And she said, it's in the bath. The father knelt by the side of it and he said, son, little champ, he said, you will be the first human being who will be fully operational in all your moving parts right from the start. Because daddy's found out exactly what everything is for. All the bits and pieces, I, I will be able to explain to you what they all do and how to work them. All except that knobbly, crinkling bit on the back of your arm. But never mind, everything else will work. Let me get you some hot water. And he poured in a whole lot of hot water from a pterodactyl's nostril, which he kept it in. And of course, the baby shrieked blue murder. And the woman said, have you gone out of your mind? Are you the first nutcase? Don't you know better than to pour hot water on a baby without testing it first? So he said, well, how do you test it? And she told him. And when she told him, as she told him, as she showed him, then the whole vision sort of faded and I was back in the present day. But I'd realised I'd been wrong. Every part of the human body does have a purpose, including the wrinkled, crinkly thing on the back of your arm. Because without an elbow, how would people throughout the ages have been able to test the temperature of a baby's bath? <laughs>
<laughs> now you may say to yourself, what has this got to do with that line from Coleridge? <laughs> well, you see, opposite me, we have this spinster lady living, this Miss Bylot. And when I made this discovery, when I had this revelation about the use of the elbow, I was so moved that I stood up like that ancient Greek gentleman and shouted, Eureka! Neglecting to notice that the bathroom window was open <laughs> and that Miss Bylot was hanging her front curtains. So I moved my lips, Miss Bylot shrieked and fell down in a fit. <laughs> a sensible an explanation of prehistory as I think I've ever heard. <laughs> and by your mark, there is a draw between the two stories, and you mustn't think the stopwatch can possibly lie because your applause lasted exactly the same amount in each particular case. And that brings us to a final score in which Dillis Powell and Frank Muir win by one mark only from Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden. And that also brings to an end this edition of my word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. presents My Word. And here to introduce the program and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words and those taking part are Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Dennis Norton and Frank Muir. Round one tries to test their vocabulary Two marks if they get the meanings of these words roughly right. We begin with Anne Scott James. Anne, what is a finnan? F I double N A N. Finnan. Oh, I think it's my favourite thing to eat. It's a kind of haddock, smoked haddock. Yes. Uh, can you be more precise about what kind of haddock? A uh, smoked, surely. Yeah, well, I think they're all smoked, as far as oh, I know. Oh, smoked over a peaty <laughs> smoke. That's better. A haddock cured with a smoke of green wood, turf, or peat. It sounds most romantic. It comes from Finden or Findhorn in Scotland, which, curious enough, I think is a salmon river, but perhaps that doesn't count. And it makes kedgeree to its credit. That's it's a very good idea. Mm. Yes. We'll add that in. I can't give another mar half mark for kedgeree. <laughs> Two marks for Finden. Frank Muir, what is a fescue, or if it helps, what is fescue? F E S C U E. I know two meanings of this. Well, that's jolly good. One, it's the, it's the beginning of bawling the jack. <laughs> First you put your two <laughs> Also, uh, and also one of the one of the lawn grasses is called chewing's fescue. Yes. I think that'll do. There are two meanings. Not the first one you gave, but the second one. It's a kind of grass. But it's also a teacher's pointer or stick. Now, Dennis Powell, what is cirrhosis? C I R R H O S I S, cirrhosis. It's a disease of the liver. Caused? 
by drinking alcohol. Yes, that's good enough. It's a disease of the liver, usually caused by excessive consumption I'll of alcohol. I'll tell you one thing about Too it, long. Jack. Mm. It's almost impossible to spell. <laughs> Is that a general statement? Or... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dennis Norton, the meaning of the word absquatulate. A-B-S-Q-U-A-T-U-L-A-T-E. Absquatulate. And I'm helping you. No, you're not helping. <laughs> Frank had a word he knew two meanings for. <laughs> I'll try and give you eight. <laughs> um, absquatulate. Well, you, you know what expostulate yes. means? <laughs> well, absquatulate is to expostulate from a sitting position. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, is, is it a verb or an adjective? It's, I mean, it's a verb. Oh. To absquatulate. I thought yes. it, was, it was an adjective, like absquatulate, shaped Postrate. like an absquat. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a verb. <laughs> but to turn your well, it's, it's, to, it's to move away from somebody. Absolutely right. You get your two marks and well done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, before we begin round two, I'm going to give each team a quotation for them to write down, and the two women members of the team will go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme I shall ask them where the quotations come from. So beginning with Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, here's your quotation. It is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, here's yours. There is a happy land far, far away. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their ideas of how these words came to be said or written. On our round two, <coughs> classical mythology had different names for the same gods, or approximately the same gods, in Greece and in Rome. For instance, the chief god of all, the king of the gods, was Zeus in Greek and Jupiter in Latin. For two marks, I want to know what are the Roman names for these Greek gods and what they were gods or goddesses of. Beginning with Anne Scott James, Poseidon. A Neptune, who's the god of the sea. Well done, two marks straight away. Frank Muir, Aphrodite. <laughs> Aphrodite and her nighty, it's a... <laughs> Aphrodite is, is Venus. Yes, and goddess of... Um, Hanky Pankery. <laughs> goddess of love. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely right. And beauty, I suppose, if you want. Uh, Dillis Powell. Artemis. Um, is it Diana? Was it Diana. 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 Goddess of? The chase. Yes. Two marks. Artemis or Diana, goddess of hunting, but also of the moon. Lennis Norden. Ares. A-R-E-S. Mars. God of war. God of War it is. <laughs> Aries Greek, Mars um, Latin, Areopagus and Sean de Mars and all that sort of thing. Two marks. Next round is Origins and Derivations. Three marks again, if members of the team can define the present meanings and then give the origin or derivation of these words or expressions or phrases. Beginning with Anne Scott James. To set someone a poser... Well, it means now to put a problem or a question, a puzzle. Yes. <coughs> and originally? Is it a sporting term? No. Well, it's a very odd kind from, of sport. From a sport, I mean. No, it's no, no good. Uh, it is, as uh, Anne says, to offer a puzzling problem or question not easy to answer. But poser is short for apposer, A-W-P-O-S-E-R, one who sets testing questions, and this used to be done by fellows of a college at a university in the setting written or oral examinations. Apposer or opposer. One out of three. Frank Muir, that's the ticket. That's favourite. That is a good course to pursue under the circumstances. Yes. And by origin? <coughs> I've got etiquette. an idea that this is etiquette. Yes. It's absolutely. one of these curious old words which have been 
uh, changed over the centuries and a syllable has detached itself. That's it. You're quite right. You'll get your three marks. It's called a definite article. Uh, <laughs> that's the ticket. Present meaning, that's just right, that's just what's wanted, that's just what you should do. But it comes from the phrase, that's etiquette. Three. <clears throat> Lilith Powell, your phrase is, no quarter. Um... No quarter means um, nobody will be spared mm -hmm. in battle or, yes. or any argument. No quarter. What well, does it mean you weren't going to be cut up in quarters? I don't know. No, that's a nice Not? thought, but it isn't true, Not. I think. No, I don't uh, know. One out of three. No quarter means to show no mercy, no holes barred, so on. Uh, one of the explanations is that in ancient Egyptian <coughs> battles, oh. if, a soldier was, if a soldier vanquished an opponent... He would spare his life if his captive gave up a quarter of his pay. And the more probable one, which you can, I think, give chapter and verse 4, is when the Spanish and the Dutch were fighting each other, quarter was the ransom for prisoners, and it meant that if you kept your prisoner alive rather than killing him on the spot, you had not only to keep him, but to keep him in quarters, that is, to give him accommodation and keep him alive. So that no quarter means uh, no accommodation for you. Don't take any prisoners. I think half a mark for the second one, Jack. <laughs> 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 I thought I had a sufficient air of conviction in my voice. <laughs> one out of three. Dennis Norton, what are infantry and why so-called? Well, infantry are, are, the, are foot soldiers. Yes. And why are they so-called? Right. French, yes. that's right. child. That's it. Infantry. Um, well, the children. Yes. The children of the army. Um, they mean foot soldiers, the marching soldiers. But it is from the Latin infans and French enfant, and the French word was infanterie. And these were young men, young men of good family, who, with their attendants, marched along behind the proper chaps, who were the, uh, the knights on horseback. They were too young. Um, to fight properly, and therefore they were infant soldiers or child soldiers, and therefore infantry. Next comes the who, how, and what department. And Scott James, how did America get its name? Um, oh, um, Amerigo Vespucci. Yes. Crossed the Atlantic to the New World. And who was he? Well, he was a Mediterranean type from either <laughs> Spain, Portugal, or Italy, you yes. guess. <laughs> yes, if you stick to, stick to Italy, Italy, okay. Or an Italian. Yes. And Enough? About, about when? I mean, not 20th about century. About when? The 15th century. Yes, that'll do. And he set up a rival expedition to that of Columbus and landed finally at the Bay of All Saints. Frank Muir, what are known as Gabriel's Hounds? <laughs> Something noisy. Yes. A bird of some sort? Yes. Um, a wild fowl? Yes, you're getting very good. Oh, what a wild fowl that honks. That's it. <laughs> yes, you've got it, you've got there. Oh. And it's what wild, what wild fowl honks? The uh, bent-billed goose <laughs> flies with the others, although it flies just as fast as the others, is not so good at slowing up. <laughs> I'll give you your two marks and let's spend it. <laughs> Gabriel's hounds are wild geese because the noise of wild geese in flight honking is not unlike that of a pack of hounds in full cry. And there's a rather charming and pathetic legend that these geese are the souls of unbaptized children wandering through the air until the day of judgment. Gabriel's hounds. Two marks. Dennis Powell, what is the Waterloo Cup and why is it so called? a sporting trophy. It's greyhound racing. Is it? Greyhound racing, says my learned colleague. Yes, but why is it called Waterloo Cup? Um, well, what, what, well, how else could you name it? <laughs> <laughs> you can't call it the Waterloo Jug. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Start, start again, Dennis, on start this, will you? Again. Greyhound. Greyhound <coughs> racing. What are, they, what are they chasing? A rabbit, a hare, they're chasing a hare. Real or artificial? Electric hare. As no. It's run. No, it's no. of course. That is where you're wrong. One mark for knowing it was a greyhound. It's greyhound not racing, but coursing. That is, they're 
chasing after a real hare. It happens witchy. each year at Altcar, and it was um, this race, was, this coursing was founded in 1836 by a man called Lynn, who was just the owner of a hotel called the Waterloo Hotel in Liverpool. I'm against and, it. Well, he also invented the Grand National. I'm against the same that, chap, too. Lynn, from the Waterloo <laughs> Hotel. Well, yes, that's Beecher's Brook, probably. One out of two. Dennis Norton, who was 16-string Jack? 16-string Jack was an early Regency <laughs> buck who wore a tight corset, which is very difficult to play. <laughs> uh, half a mark, I think. For, no, he no, had very high lace boots with 16 strings. That's getting nearer, isn't it? Yes, his eyes lit up at that. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't think we'd get anywhere near. No, 16-string Jack was a notorious highwayman called Jack Rann. He was hanged in 1744, but he was a bit of a fop and a ladies' man, and he always had eight tags at each knee. And Dr. Johnson once said that Thomas Gray's poetry tired above the ordinary run of verse, just as 16-string Jack tired above the ordinary footpad. So he must have been rather well-known in his day. Well, the next round concerns initials and abbreviations. Two marks, if you can tell me what these things stand for. And Scott James, PG. Per something. Oh, P G. PG. Paying guest. Yes. Oh, Paying guest it is. Too much. Frank Muir, hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> H Y. Hello, big... Yarmouth. <laughs> <laughs> a big H and a little Y and no dot between them. Hi. Is it a Christian name? Yes. Harry. Well, nearly. Henry. Yes, <laughs> crept home. Henry. Two marks here. <laughs> no, don't be silly. The cost of a mark it can't be true. It is. Big H, a little Y. High C Knickerbocker means Henry C. Not Knickerbocker. <laughs> <laughs> Dillis Powell. Petriburg. P E T R I B U R G with a dot. Petriburg. Short for something. Yes. yes. St Petersburg. Put that in English, and you're right. Peterborough. Uh, Yes, getting very close to him. Yes. Um, he's a bishop. Yes. Petriburg so... is the short form of the Latin name for Peterborough, and Petriburg is really what you might call half of a bishop because he ought to have his Christian name in front of it. So if it were Ephraim or William Petriburg, that would be the bishop. And uh, it is short because otherwise he's the right reverend, the Lord Bishop of Peterborough. Now, Dennis Norton, MCC. <laughs> Latin for 1,200. <laughs> <laughs> or the Marylebone Cricket Club or the Middlesex County Council. Jolly good. Thank you. Sorry I can't give you a bonus. <laughs> and now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave to the teams earlier on in the programme. So first of all, for two marks, and. Can you give me the origin of your quotation? It is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. I think it's Tennyson. Yes. There is another version of it, a, a rather sort of uh, cynical version by Samuel Butler, which is, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have lost at all, but that came later. And now, Dennis Powell, your quotation. Can you give me its origin? And you'll remember it was, there is a happy land far, far away. It's from a hymn, Jack. Yes, by? Um, Han Hannah Moore, um, Mary Taylor. No, you're doing awfully well, but you haven't got the right one. I think that's the only, only hymn writers I know. I'll give you mm, a fairly generous half mark for knowing it was a hymn. It was written by Andrew Young, and it came in C.H. Bateman's Sacred Songbook of 1843. Well, now I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. And so, back to the quotation for Dennis, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. I don't think that my life has been completely empty because I too have memories 
of the sort of love that comes to a man once, perhaps, in a lifetime. She was a lady plumber. <laughs> By that, I don't mean that she was the wife of Lord Henry Plummer or anything like that. I mean, she was a plumber, a feminine plumber. How we met was that I had taken a house in the country for three months in order to finish a novel. I'm a very slow reader. <laughs> I was conscious after a week that all was not well with the upstairs wash basin. So I rang the landlord and he said, I'll send a plumber around. And the next day, I was dozing in the garden when suddenly I felt a tap on my shoulder. <laughs> It, it was, um, it was her. And she said, I've come, I, I always remember those words, the first word she spoke. I've come about the smell on the land. She said, I said, you, you are a plumber. And she nodded briefly. My name, she said, is Amaryllis Micklethwaite. It's a name that's engraved on my heart now. And when you think of the number of letters there are in <laughs> Amaryllis Micklethwaite, it's a lot of engraving, really. I took her up to the offending wash basin. She cast a connoisseur's eye on it, gave it an expert tap with a spanner, and about four square inches of porcelain crashed onto the floor. <laughs> Hello, she said. I'll have to get at your main tank. So I led her to the loft and she said, this will take a bit of time. It took four days. <laughs> she was up there four days dickering about with my main return pipe. <laughs> and that's when we got to know each other. We talked, golly, how we talked. And she told me all about herself. And she said to me, fiercely, nothing will make me give up plumbing, ever. I remember she was bashing the tank, as she said. <laughs> and I said, nothing, not even if a man proposed marriage to you. There was a little silence. And then she gently touched my hand with the soldering iron. <laughs> when, when the cooking fumes had cleared, she said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Domestic life is not for me. I protested, I cried out. I said, but you, you can't, you can't come into my life and then just leave it like this. She said, don't blame me, it's, it's not my fault. It's not anybody's fault. It's just this whole rotten system. <laughs> and she left. With that, she left. Leaving me, as with my sole memento of her, a nine inch bar of iron with a ratchet on the end. Well, as you can imagine, it was a wrench. <laughs> I, I never saw her again, but I'll never forget her, because not only did she leave a gap in my heart that will never be filled, she also left her spanner in the immersion heater. <laughs> so that the first time I switched the hot water on, the whole tank exploded <laughs> and the entire loft was blown sky high. But the loss of a loft is a small price to pay for the memories which I carry. Indeed, as Alfred Lord Tennyson said, it is better to have lost a loft than never to have loved at all. <laughs> still think that girl chose wrongly. <laughs> and now we go on to Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, there is a happy land far, far away. The curious that Dennis's story is a love story, because mine is in a sense. It was when I was working as a sound effects lad, 
at the BBC. My chief was an elderly man of about 25. <laughs> Shows you how far back it is. Called Ernest. Now, Ernest was a weakling. He was a very devoted sound effects man, but he, he wasn't strong of physique. He was one of life's losers. At that time, this is many, many years ago, BBC had decided to mount a programme called Desert Island Discs in which a gentleman called Roy Plumley would be marooned on a desert island with a gramophone and he'd have to ask people what sort of records they'd take. And to accompany this, we had to produce the sound of a seagull, which we got from a record, and also the sound of waves. Now, to a good sound effects man, there's only one way to reproduce the sound of the waves, and that is to get a shell which you hold to your ear, or in this case, a microphone, and that reproduces the sound of the ocean. And as it happens, an abalone shell produces the finest kind of ocean. So, Ernest and I were told to go and hunt an abalone. They, they stick to rocks very tightly, these abalone shells, these mollusks, and you have to shoot them off the rock. And we were issued a rifle apiece, and we went down to Broadstairs on the beach with a tent apiece to hunt down the abalone. <laughs> but Ernest brought his girlfriend. Her name was May Chitterling. And when I saw her, well, the blood cursed through my veins. She was, she was all woman. She had hips like a hundred-watt bulb. And, and her superstructure... I will content myself with saying that from the age of 18, whatever the weather, her feet never got wet. <laughs> it happened, I think it was the Friday. It was a very warm evening. I left my tent for a stroll along the sand. I unbuttoned my khaki shirt and let the wind ripple through my vest. <laughs> And suddenly, I, I heard footsteps, footfalls in the sand beside me. And there was May. She just looked at me and said, You're a man. Ernest isn't a man. You're a man. She whispered in a rather deep voice. She said, Whoever wins the mollusk wins me. <laughs> you can imagine how I paced the sands that evening in the fitful moonshine, searching, searching for that gleaming white thing to the, stuck to a rock. And suddenly, I could scarce believe my eyes. There it was, like an elongated emu's egg with holes in it, an, an abalone. I crept back to my tent, fetched the rifle. Five yards away, I lifted the rifle to my shoulder, and suddenly I heard the sound of a sob. It was earnest, <laughs> sobbing. <laughs> And I realised that my, with me, it was just brute masculinity. <laughs> Poor little Ernest, he really loved this woman. And I don't know what came over me, some little impulse, but suddenly maturity dawned. And then I did something, a far, far better thing then I did, than what I have ever since done now or at any other... <laughs> uh, <laughs> all I did was I pointed at the shape of the shell, and I handed Ernest the rifle. <coughs> and quietly, not loudly, I said, there is an abalone, fire, fire away. <laughs> hope there'll be a later instalment of the life of Ernest and May in the next programme. Well, by your vote, Dennis Norden wins the contest of the stories, and Dennis Norden and Anne Scott James win the whole contest, this programme, by one and a half marks from Dillis Powell and Frank Muir. My word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason, 
and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dennis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Round one tests their vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meanings of these words right. Beginning with Dillis Power. Dillis, what is Elan? E L A N. With an accent on it? Uh, yes, it would have an accent on an the accent E. On it. French nylon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a kind of enthusiastic dash, a leap forward. Hello Enthusiasm. Then. Yes. Impetuosity, dash. The sort of thing that cavalry do when you let them go. Two marks it is. Hence the Uhlans. Yes. <laughs> All right, Dennis Norton, yours is quite different. Dennis, what is an oleometer? O-L-E-O-M-E-T-E-R. Oleometer. Well, an ometer means a gauge or mm -hmm. measuring device. An ole measuring... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's you kind of audition curates. <laughs> 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 Oleometer. Um, <laughs> or it could be bullfighters. Or yes. Yes. No, I, um, it, it's, it's like oleo, the American word for... Yes. It's, it's, it's um, oiliness. It's yes. a measure of oiliness. It's for auditioning disc jockeys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't guess what they actually invented it for, Dennis. No, no, they don't. But we've come to you. Well, it's it's an it's an oily measure. It's a measure measure of of the amount of oil in something. Hold up, oil gauge, oil measure. And Scott James, what is a diva? D i v a, diva. I think it's just another word for a prima donna. Yes, you're absolutely dead right. It's a great woman singer. I don't mean by that she's a very large woman singer. I mean. Uh, <laughs> A great singer who happens to be a woman, um, or a prima donna, and it comes from uh, a Latin word meaning goddess. Frank Miller, what is a spire valve? S P I R I V A L V E. Spire valve. Would it be any point at all in suggesting there's a valve shaped like a spire? <laughs> it depends in which sense you're using the word valve, but otherwise that would be not at all bad. Is it a uh, a crustacean. Yes. Or because that sort of I know oysters are bivalves. Yes. So this, this is, is a spiny valve. Yes. It's a spiral shaped oyster. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> delete oyster and I'll give you two marks. It's something that has a spiral shell. Or it might be the spiral of a shell when you had a look at it and so it went round and round and round like a staircase. It's a whelk. <laughs> <laughs> Welk would do. Well, before we start round two, I'm going to give each team a quotation for them to write down. And I want the two women members of our team to study the quotations. And then at the end of the program, I shall ask them where those two quotations come from. So, beginning with Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is, Our Sweet Mystery of Life. And Anne Scott James and Dennis, yours is, we have no time to stand and stare. And then at the end of the program, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their ideas of how these words came to be said or written. Well, round two is...
terribly difficult, and it's all about mythology and legend. Two marks if you get uh, an answer reasonably right. Beginning with Delis Power, who or what was the chimera? The chimera was a kind of monster mm -hmm. which had um, three heads. No, you were mixing it up with Cerberus. A snake no. head, a lion head. Yes. A lion head. Yes. And it had a sort of goat's body mm -hmm. and a snake's tail. Yes, quite right. And what happened? Um, somebody, somebody, <laughs> somebody met it. <laughs> um, somebody met it and destroyed it. Yes. And I think it was Heracles. No, it wasn't. Wasn't it? It was Theseus. No, no, it was chap on a horse. Ah, Pegasus. Yes, but he wasn't. Pegasus was, was, was a horse. Was it a horse? Not the chap. Bellerophon. <laughs> Bellerophon. Um, Yes. Mm. This is very difficult. I give you a certain amount of help here. Yeah? I think one and a half wouldn't be unjust in the way of marking. It was a fire-breathing monster, front like a lion, middle like a goat, and end like a dragon or serpent, who um, lived in Lycia and did a terrible amount of damage all round, was killed by this hero called Bellerophon, who had an unfair advantage in having a horse with wings, which most people don't do, even in the Grand National. And... Uh, um, it can be used nowadays to mean any kind of fanciful <coughs> bogey or creature of the imagination. Chimera. One and a half. Dennis Norton, who or what was a Sibyl? S-I-B-Y-L. It was a, a who rather than a yes, what. Yes, quite right. The Sibyls were <coughs> ladies who used to sit in caves and, and when anything went wrong in Greece... People used to come along and ask them, and they used to write it on a leaf and throw it outside the cave. So there was one at a place called Kumai. Yes, who good. Got, um, she had one of these rather rotten things happen to her but from Apollo. The gods used to do these rather dirty tricks. And he, she gave him some advice, and he said, you can have anything you want. And she said, I would like to live as many years as you have grains of sand in your hand he had a handful of sand at the time for reasons which escaped me at the moment. <laughs> but she neglected to say that she wanted to be young and healthy all that time. <laughs> so he let her live all that amount of years. So she lived about 2,814 years feeling poorly all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely dead right, Dennis. That's a wonderful description of a Cumayan Sybil. Later on, Sybil became a, any kind of old sorceress or even old hag. Two marks. And Scott James, who was Circe? Oh, Circe was one of my favourite characters in the Odyssey. Yes. Because um, when any of the men had eaten of her food and drunk of her drink, she turned them into swine. Yes. <laughs> oh, <it seemed> <laughs> a good kind idea of for the housewife to copy. <laughs> she was very attractive and seductive. Yes. But Ulysses um, was sensible enough not to be tempted. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that'll do it. But all his men went honk honking round the island. They did, like anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, two marks. She was the daughter of the sun god, Helios, and lived on the island of Ea. And Odysseus, as usual, got shipwrecked there with his companions. And they all drank a magic potion that Circe gave them, and they all turned as, um, and quite rightly says, into swine. But Odysseus had been given a special antidote, a thing called Molly, by uh, the god Hermes, and he was immune and didn't turn into a pig. Two marks. Frank Muir. Who was Andromeda? The Greek faintest idea. She was chained to a rock and so, saved by yeah. Perseus. Apparently, Jack, <coughs> <laughs> she was enchained to a rock. Yes. Quite and right. saved by Pythagoras. No. Perseus. <laughs> that, Perseus. that is best as a theorem. <laughs> she was saved by Perseus. Saved by Perseus. Saved by Perseus she was, and I think that's probably just good enough, and I could just get your two marks. She was the daughter of Cepheus, who was king of Ethiopia, and her mother was Cassiopeia, who said that she was the most beautiful person in the world, Cassiopeia about herself, and that angered the sea god Poseidon, who said, because you are being um, a bit um, proud about yourself, I'm going to send you a sea monster, and the sea monster was going to eat up Andromeda, the daughter, who was chained to the rock, as Frank Miller says, 
And luckily, Perseus turned up just in time, cheating as usual with uh, winged sandals and a gorgon's head, so that he turned the sea monster into an enormous great rock. <clears throat> well, the next round is origins and derivations of various words or expressions or phrases, and three marks, if you can give a correct answer, showing the present meaning, and then the origin or derivation that it comes from. And beginning with Lewis Powell, your phrase is, in Queer Street. Um, it, it means being in, in uh, severe difficulties, presume, uh, usually um, financial. Yes, <laughs> that'll, do, that'll do, yes. And originally? Now you do with a, a German, quer, I mean, cross or something like that. That's a nice idea. I don't think... It's a good it's, idea. Uh, yes, an awfully <coughs> good idea, yes. Um, to be in Queer Street means to be in financial or other difficulties, and it's alleged to come from a time when, as I suppose they still do, tradesmen put a question mark or a query against the name of customers uh, with whom they were a bit chary of uh, advancing credit. So it was originally Query Street, and from that, Queer Street. Fairly simple. Dennis Norton. Show a leg there. <laughs> this is one of those awful things that they wake you up with in the service. And how did it come to mean that? Uh, I think it originally de derived from whenever you get out of bed, you show a leg. Yeah. But there is this thing about getting out of a hammock yes. in the days when women and chaps went to sea together. In other words, sailors were allowed to bring their wives to sea. Yes. Nowadays, it means it's time to get out of bed, a revalley time and so on. Um, and I think Dennis is quite right. It, uh, it was the boatswain's or boatswain's mate's cry to get sailors up when they were not in the least inclined to get out of bed. But at one time, though this is certainly not true of Her Majesty's Navy at the present, um, you could have on board with you a wife, or at any rate somebody who passed as your wife, and if um, a stockinged leg was hanging over the edge of the hammock, uh, you knew that that one hadn't got to be got up quite so early in the morning, because though the men had to go on parade, uh, the women were allowed to sort of sit and somebody brought them cups of tea later on. <laughs> Anne Scott James, Jerry Builder. Well, it means somebody who builds Jim Crack, shoddy, ramshackle houses. And originally? Jerry Mander. <laughs> Does it come from No, 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 go, go a bit more biblical. Oh, uh, Jeremiah. Yes, that's more like it. Well, Jeremiah was the man who wailed and moaned. Yeah. So I suppose you wail and moan if you're unlucky enough to pay a large sum for a jerry-built house. I think that's absolutely dead right. Three marks. <laughs> um, a builder who does a shoddy, cheap job... And there are, in fact, two possible origins. One is the one given um, by Anne, that Jerry comes from Jeremiah, this chap who was continuously foretelling decay and ruin all around him, including possibly houses. The other one is that um, it comes from Jericho. If you remember, people marched and marched round the walls of Jericho. It sounds much more likely, doesn't blowing it? Blowing trumpets, and yes. the, and the city walls, walls fell down. So three marks it is. Hank Miller. To raise someone's screw means to increase his wages. Yes. Why? To raise raise the screw. Hmm. Anything to do with ships, propellers. No. Nope. One out of three. According to Dr. Johnson, in his dictionary, raising the screw meant you gave men wages in a sort of little bag, like you have five shillings worth of copper from your bank. If you ever do have five shillings worth of copper from your bank. And all these little bags are the same size, but if you've got rather more money, then the little screw that tied up the bag at the top was much higher. If you had little money, you could make an enormous great screw with only about tuppence in the bottom. So that um, raising the screw meant that uh, the smaller the screw at the top, the more money inside the bag. All right, the next round is the who, how, and what department. Two marks for a right answer. Dennis Powell, who was Charles Darnay? Um, a novel by a 19th century yes. author. Yes. By Dick Dickens. Dickens. Yes. Tale of Two Cities. Well done. <laughs> Do you remember what happened to him? Um, was he the, the one who didn't get executed? That's right. who, who, um, the uh, 
the chap who was really no good but turned out to be the yes. great hero took his place on the scaffold. Absolutely right. Well done. Two marks and well deserved. Charles Dickens's Tale of Two Cities, Charles Darnay was smuggled out of prison by Sidney Carton, who was executed in his place in the French Revolution. Um, Dennis Norden, it tells me here that we all know that Dr. Kinsey wrote the Kinsey Report. Well, we would have worked it out. <laughs> <laughs> but what we want to know is who wrote the Chapman Report? Irving Wallace. Well done. Mm. Two marks it is. A novel by Irving Wallace, <coughs> The Chapman Report. Anne Scott James, in what play by what author do we find the character Tamora? T-A-M-O-R-A. Macbeth. No. <laughs> Tamora and Tamora and Tamora. <laughs> <Beats> on this. <laughs> well, it's very... A lot of people are rather doubtful whether it belongs to the canon, as you might say, but I know you must interpret that. It comes... Oh, much. from a spurious play of Shakespeare's. Well, it probably isn't, but people have often thought so. <laughs> no. That leaves time to say Andronicus. Yes. And in Titus Andronicus, do you remember who Tamora was? No. no. Absolutely no. no. She was the evil queen of the Goths in this play, which was probably by Shakespeare, Titus Andronicus. So I believe it was Andronicus, really, but he called it Titus Andronicus. And she did terrible things, and terrible things happened to a girl particularly, called, uh, the one called Lavinia. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you after the programme, Frank. One out of two. Frank me on. The taking of three wickets with three successive balls in cricket is known as the hat trick. Why? If you take three wickets, you have to buy the umpire a hat. <laughs> Johnny nearly right. I well, that's fair why, enough, then. I don't see why you should buy the umpire a hat. It might be the other way around. <coughs> uh, the man who takes three wickets and the umpire buys him a hat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've done my best. One and a half, I think. In, originally, any bowler who took a hat trick was entitled to receive a new hat at the expense, not of the umpire, but of his club. And it was a top hat, too, which was terribly useful for catching and point and, and <coughs> slips and places like that. And now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier on in the programme. So, for two marks in Dillis Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Ah, sweet mystery of life. It's a song. Mm. Yes. I always, uh, I'm under the impression it's always sung at um, at funerals at that Hollywood cemetery. Yes, I think that's good enough for two. It comes from an operetta called Naughty Marietta, and I'm informed that the music was written by Victor Herbert and uh. the lyrics by Rita Johnson. <laughs> Anne Scott James, the origin of your quotation: "We have no time to stand and stare." It was written by W. H. Davis. Yeah, two marks. What is this life if, full of care, we have no time to stand and stare? A poem by W. H. Davis, the super tramp, which he called Leisure. Well, now I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause <coughs> from the audience here in the theatre. So, back to Frank Muir with his quotation, Ah, sweet mystery of life. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> honourable gentlemen, I cannot disagree more with the views expressed by my honourable friend. The trouble with the youth of this great and wonderful country of ours is not any degeneration of the moral standard. It is the decline in the good old British crusty loaf. <laughs> you just cannot get a good old British crusty loaf in this day and age. Throughout literature, where did Sherlock Holmes live? <laughs> Throughout literature, it's the same story from Mr. Addison's partner, Sir Richard Stale to Agatha Crusty. <laughs> and not only literature. Honourable gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, in music, in the tonic sol fa, 
What does it begin with? And what does it end on? <laughs> Do we me fa so la ti? Do. <laughs> Take lawyers, Mr. Speaker. What is the highest office to which a solicitor in this great land of ours can attain? Master of the rolls. But what happened? <laughs> When our country was great, the crusty loaf was among us. Then in the 18th century, they repealed the corn laws. <laughs> the crusty loaf got smaller and more meager. Some common people couldn't get it. When they couldn't get their crusty loaf, they grew lazy and lackluster and just leant against the village fences. Hence the expression, loafer. <laughs> they were no good. These men were good for nothing. They sank lower and lower down the moral scale. And so, until we get the British crusty loaf back, we are not worthy to win back our abba. And I urge the government to make this their responsibility to set a man with a pa, with the necessary pa, <laughs> to speak a, a man at ministerial level, to bring the bakers to heel and to give us back the crusty loaf that made Britain what it is today. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, should ministerial powers be set up to bring our crusty loaf back, then I will feel that my parliamentary career will not have been wasted because I will be able to sing to myself that lovely old ballad. Ah, sweet ministry of loaf, at last I've founded you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's breach of privilege, but we shall learn that before the, end, before the end of the parliamentary session. And we go on to Dennis Norden. And if you remember, his quotation was, we have no time to stand and stare. Where is this eloquent plea for a return to the simple values best illustrated? I put it to you that if you will, in the words of our Member of Parliament, use your loaf. <laughs> you will find that is best illustrated in the life of Arnold Haskell, who invented one of the great feats of modern engineering, which to this day still bears his name, the moving staircase, or Haskellator. <laughs> is sometimes known. He was an interesting man. When he left his village school, he set off for the big city where he answered an advertisement in the Domestic Post's vacant column of the Times, an advertisement saying, wanted three footmen or one yard man. <laughs> clumping, clumping for the former, he entered the service of Lord Prufrock. Every morning, he had to take the noble lord up his cup of tea, knock on the door, enter, draw back the heavy curtains, and say, my lord, a fine Thursday, God bless the queen, tea up. <laughs> now, you may say, where is this duty onerous? I will ask you to remember the design of the aristocratic houses in those days. The tea was made in the kitchen, which was the sub-basement. His lordship's bedroom was on the fourth floor. So, the tea had to be carried up 104 stairs. So quite often he might start off at half past eight with the tea, and by the time his lordship got it, it would be getting on for quarter to ten. 
<laughs> now, naturally, after performing this task for 14 years, Arnold started thinking there must be a better way. <laughs> and it fr was from there only a short step to the thought, what if the teacup stayed still and the stairs moved? <laughs> Thus it was, Lord Prufrock became the first lord whose townhouse possessed a moving staircase, and the original moving staircase, Haskell's Number no. 1, it was called, was very much like the ones you see now, except, of course, having no electricity, it was hand-operated. <laughs> In other words, there was a big footman underneath the big wheel, which provided the motion, and as the stairs went up and disappeared under that little grill at the top. There were two other footmen who took each stair, slid down a pole with it, ran to the bottom <laughs> and fed it through so that it could start its upward journey again. Indeed, if these two footmen were late, anybody entering it would be faced with a yawning gap and a drop straight down onto the chapel was turning the wheel. And it was, as you may think, a mere novelty until World War I. But the paradoxical part of it, you see, is that this instrument, which was invented towards the help of gracious living, today in every underground, if you watch the people using it, how many of them actually let Arnold's invention carry them? They don't. Even though this is moving upwards or downwards at a speed faster than they can run, they still run on it in order to gain that extra one and a half seconds with which they're going to make their fortune. So if Arnold Haskell were to come back today, well may he say, what is this life if full of care we have no time to stand on a stair? <laughs> By your vote, Frank Muir wins the contest of the stories, and that brings us to a final score in which Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden win by two marks from Frank and from Dillis Powell, and that also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Round one tries to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they can get the meaning of these words right. And we begin with Anne Scott James. Anne, I'd like to know what's the meaning of the verb anathematize. Anathematize. Well, anathema is something you loathe. Anathematize means to um, denounce or curse. Yes, that's absolutely right. To put under a ban or to curse. And uh, anathema is often used rather lightly these days. Such so-and-so is anathema to me, but really you're saying something pretty terrible if you do say that. It means that he's accursed of God 
and should be excommunicated by his church, anathematized to curse. Frank Miller, what is ennui? E-double-N-U-I, ennui. Ooh, yes, it's a <clears throat> contemporary French playwright. <laughs> 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 ring round the moon. It's also an old English word, or Middle English word, meaning the, um, the eighth-born son. <laughs> There's an old ballad which says, I'm Ennui the eighth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it also means boredom through lack of activity. Yes, that's... A true. kind of a mental stagnation. That's what you'll get your two marks for. <laughs> Mental weariness from lack of occupation or lack of interest, uh, a, a particularly intense form of boredom, comes from Latin in odio, same word roughly as annoy. Dennis Powell, what is a capote? C A P O T E. It's a hood. Yes. Uh, it is. Well, yes, that's the top bit of it. Well, it's a, it's a cloak with a hood. Yes, that's it. Like Christopher Robin's nanny's dressing gown. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful blue, but it hasn't a capote. <laughs> <laughs> that's roughly it. Uh, soldiers, or it could be a traveller's, long cloak with a hood. And it's um, French, from a diminutive from cape. Capote. Two marks. Dennis Norton, what is a die-dapper? Die-dapper? Yes. Well, too, it sounds like... <laughs> Die dapper. It sounds like um, like a like, um, a, a suicide pilot who takes care of his uniform. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it sounds much more like an American yes. baby's nappy. Mm -hmm. Would it help you if I called it dive dapper? That would help tremendously. <laughs> That is a great help. A kind it's of a, bird. It's a man. It's with... a plunger bird. That's right. It's a bird which comes swooping down with a tremendous beak and oh, gets yes. fish out of the water. Yes, it's a, it's a bird. Yes, that sounds All right, good. one and a half, because, again, I give it quite a lot of help. It is short for dive dapper, die dapper, small diving waterfowl, such as the little grebe or the dabchick. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and then the two women members of the team go on studying those quotations, and at the end of the programme I shall ask them where the quotations come from. So, first of all, Anne Scott James and Dennis, your quotation is, was this the face that launched a thousand ships? And Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, yours is, a rose-red city, half as old as time. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these words came to be said or written. And so to round two, which is uh, questions on mythology and legend. Two marks if you get them right. And Scott James, who was Stentor? S-T-E-N-T-O-R. Stentor. He was a man who roared. He did. Very loud voice. Yes. On what kind of occasions? Um, Greek occasions. Yes. Greek occasions, <laughs> yes. Quite right. Yes. Specifically right. <laughs> was Greek, yes. Who was he roaring at? He must have been roaring. I'm sure he, we get him in the Odyssey, don't yes, we? Yes, that's yeah. it. Yes, he was roaring at the Odysseus and his uh, ship. Roaring? And his merry men. No, he was roaring at the other side. Who were the other side? Roaring at the Trojans, was yes, he now? Yes, more than that. Yes, I'm normal. sorry, but I've forgotten that. Yes, two marks. He was the herald of the Greeks in front of Troy while they were besieging Troy. And he was terribly useful because all the Trojans could hear him from an awful long way away because his voice was as loud as the voice of 50 ordinary men. He was a sort of super town crier. Two marks. Frank Muir, who was Europa? A very, very lovely lady. Yes. <laughs> and she was uh, Zeus's, what the history books called, good friend. <laughs> and, uh, How did they become good friends? She was snatched away to Crete, and the rest of the story is bull. <laughs> <laughs> Two marks, lest Frank goes any further. Uh, she was the daughter of a Phoenician king, and she was, as Frank says, so lovely that Zeus, the king of the gods, fell in love with her and did one of his um, well-known transformations in order to get away with her. He waited till Europa was playing on the beach with her attendants, and then Zeus came out of the waves, probably roaring, in the shape of a white bull, 
And he was so tame that Europa climbed onto his back and he swam all the way with her to Crete. And there she became the mother of Minos and Rhadamanthus and Sarpedon and also the ancestress of all of us in Europe. So quite a girl. Two marks. <laughs> Delisbao, who was Phidippides? Um, oh. Uh, Phidippides ran. Yes, he ran. He ran. And he ran the marathon race. He did? First, the first marathon. Why? Uh, because he wanted to bring the news to Athens mm -hmm. about the victory at marathon. And what happened at the end of the race? He fell down dead. Well done. <laughs> Two marks it is. Like the marathon, uh, the race founded because of this, of course, didn't start then. It started when the Olympic Games um, were reinstituted at the end of the 19th century. And the distance of the marathon is exactly, in its modern race, the distance between marathon and Athens, which is, I'm told, 26 miles and 385 yards. Dennis Norton, who are the satyrs? S-A-T-Y-R-S, -S, satyrs. Well, they, they were... Um, they were men with goats where their trousers ought to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> in other words, they were goats from above, from below the waist. Yes. And what did they? And they hung around the woods, mm. and they went after the nymphs. It's all very contemporary, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, too much it is. Creatures of the woods and mountains, they were half man, half beast, like their master, Pan. And, as um, Dennis hints, they were idle and lascivious, representing the vital powers of nature. And they had bodies of men, but the pointed ears of a goat, and as well the horns and the hooves and tails of goats. They weren't at all nice to know, especially for young ladies. Well, the next round is about origins and derivations. Three marks if teams can define the present meanings and then give me the origin or derivation of these words or expressions or phrases. And Anne Scott James, yours is to see how things pan out. Well, it means to see what happens, mm -hmm. how things, how events turn out. Yes. And in origin? Pan for gold. Could it be anything yes. to do with that? Yes. Um... Well, that's about it, isn't it? Panning for gold means... Um, what did you do? Sift, uh, um, uh, sifting it, uh, sifting the gold from the um, rubbish and the... the dirty <laughs> ore. Oh, yes. and orange peel. <laughs> <laughs> and the other stuff which you find in, uh, in uh, gold mines. Yes, that's good enough. It's um, not a terribly scientific description, Anne, but it'll <laughs> do. <laughs> to see how things pan out, to see what happens, to see how things turn out. Uh, from the old gold prospectors, and in the diggings, in order to separate the gold from the earth, soil was put in a shallow pan and washed in running water, and this washed away the mud, and the gold sank to the bottom of the pan, so when you held the pan up, you could see exactly how the thing had panned out. Frank Noah, boudoir. <laughs> it's a law, it's a room, a bedroom, distinguished by the fact that the lampshades have frilly bits around them and there are no ashtrays. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it's milady's room. Yes. Fine. Yeah. Good. How, how does it come to have that meaning? Um, it's from the French, Jane. Yeah. To sulk. <laughs> she went to, to sulk. sulk. She went to sulk. Yes. It's the Marquis de Sulk. Who <laughs> <laughs> uh, was waiting in the boudoir. Well, three marks. It is the wife's or young lady's own personal room to which males are not normally supposed to be invited. And it comes from the French word boudet to sulk, was known as the sulking place where the wife went when she was terribly, terribly upset. Tell us, Powell, on the side of the angels. Well, it means on the right, virtuous, moral side. Mm -hmm. And comes from? Well, it comes from um, being on the side of the angels. <laughs> Jack Franker, it, it comes from... It comes from a debate in the House of Commons <laughs> and was said by Benjamin Disraeli. Yes. And the debate was on Darwin's origin oh. of the species. And they had to decide whether... I think the question was asked whether men, in fact, were on the side of the apes or the angels. <laughs> You've got everything right except what the sporting press calls the venue. It was a famous speech by Disraeli, and it was at the Oxford Diocesan Conference in 1864, not in the House of Commons. And he was discussing the Darwinian theory and said, the question is this, is man an ape 
or an angel. I, my Lord, am on the side of the angels. And nowadays it means to be on the side of right or accepted values or establishment. Dennis Norton, dominoes. Same to you, Jack. Um, <laughs> well, it's that game that you play in pubs or when children have got measles in bed. You know. <laughs> what does it come from? It doesn't go back to the Latin, does it? Is it dominus? It yes, a dominus, master. No, a domina, a mistress. A domina, I was trying to avoid that. <laughs> a lady. <laughs> All right, one and a half for ingenuity. Nowadays, a game played with small tablets of plastic or ivory or wood with varying numbers of dots on them, and it began with monks in a monastery in France, two of whom invented the game, playing it with square stones on which they'd mark these little dots, and the winner of each game, when he did win, said... Dixit Dominus Domino Meo, which is the first line of the service of Vespers in the evening. And eventually all the other monks began joining in, and they couldn't say that long phrase every time anybody won, so they just said Domino. And sometimes you'll find old players in a pub who, when they win finally, do say Domino. One and a half out of three. Well, the next round's a quickie round. Questions about mysteries and thrillers, some of them vintage ones and some of them newer. Two marks. And Scott James. Who was Irene Adler? Sherlock, uh, Sherlock Holmes. Holmes. Yes. She was the lady with a problem in Sherlock Holmes. You said a quickie. I've been quick. Yes. That's good enough. Two marks. She's the only woman that Sherlock Holmes ever found himself very deeply attracted to. <laughs> Irene Adler. Frank Muir, who was Caramane? The, the Moonstone. <laughs> no, no. Fu Manchu. Yes. From Sex Roma. Yes. Wrote Fu Manchu. Yes. She's the beautiful oriental girl, and she appears in all the Fu Manchu series by Sax Roma, and Dr. Petrie was infatuated by her. And that must have been jolly nice for him. Dennis Powell, who was Chief Inspector Roderick Allen, or oh, I'm not certain whether he isn't called Elaine, because it's spelt A-L-L-E-Y-N. He's the detective in a novel by one of the women detective writers. Yes. Not Marjorie Allingham. No. Naomi. That's right. Chief Inspector Roderick Allen of Scotland Yard is the favourite detective of Naomi Marsh in, I think, pretty nearly all her detective stories. Mm. Dennis Norton, what's the name of the very last Ian Fleming novel about James Bond? The Man with the, with the Golden Gun. That's it. Mm. Well, now we come to the last round, and we go back to the quotations I gave the two teams earlier on in the programme. And to begin with, for two marks, and Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Was this the face that launched a thousand ships? Uh, yes, it's from Marlowe's Faust. Yes? It's when all the phantoms are being... Um, when the phantom of Helen is being shown yes, to, yes. to Faust. Absolutely right. Two marks. Dennis Powell, the origin of your quotation, a rose-red city half as old as time. It's a line from a poem, the author, which I don't know, and it refers to Petra. And Petra is? It's miles away in, in the east, and it has terrific sort of Greek temples and carvings and Roman Actually, things. Actually, it's a lot Goodness of holes in what? the cliff, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's, in a, yes. It's, it's in a gorge. In a mm. gorge. Yeah, I was long together. I've never mm. been able to get there yet. Yes, the main point is the rocks are a, a, a wonderful mm. sort of red rose colour. Color, yes. rose, rose red colour. Um, it's by somebody, some rather obscure person yes. who's not famous. It's a name like Thomas. <laughs> Not quite, but still. Um, one and a half for topographical accuracy, I think. <laughs> it's Dr. a poem that's called Petra, and it was written by the Reverend John William Burgon, B-U-R-G-O-N, and it does refer to this <laughs> rose-red city in the, the gorge. Well, now I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being, and on this occasion... The marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Dennis Norton with his quotation, was this the face that launched a thousand ships? When I look across the stage at Frank, <laughs> <laughs> sitting there with a sensitive, aristocratic face, and I think back to the very first time when I ever saw him. Hollow-eyed, <laughs> gaunt, unshaven, unwashed, 
dressed in rags, standing in the gutter in Old Compton Street, <laughs> holding out a greasy cloth cap and singing, Ramona. <laughs> and I prodded him gingerly with my umbrella. And I said, look here, my good pauper. <laughs> when did you last eat? And he said, seven weeks ago, Garvin. <laughs> gnawing at my umbrella ferry. <laughs> and I said, would you be interested in a proposition which might bring you food? And he said, I'd do anything, Gov. I'd do anything. I'm starving. I'm just starving. I said, stop it. Quickly, I hailed a cab and bundled him in. And inside the cab, I told him my predicament. You see, at that time, this was many years ago, I was in great trouble with the income tax. See, what had happened is I'd taken out this submissive bird to a fish and chip place for lunch. And the bill had come to 15 shillings. Now, thinking to evade some income tax, I had altered the 15 shillings to 150 shillings <laughs> and sent it off as part of my business expenses, noting it down as lunch with a colleague. However, the income tax inspector had written back saying that he queried this, would I go and see him? I went and saw him, and he brought this bill out. He says, 150 shillings, lunch with a colleague. He said, how could two people possibly eat food to the value of £7.10 in a fish and chip shop? <laughs> so I said, well, my colleague ordered extra chips. <laughs> he said, I have investigated these figures. He said, let us assume that the two meals that you ate came to 15 shillings. He said, this would mean, he said, a portion of chips is approximately two shillings. In order to bring the bill up to seven pound 10, your colleague would have had to have eaten 67 and a half portions of chips. <laughs> he said, but look here, my dear fellow. He said, 67 and a half portions. He said, there's roughly 15 chips in a portion. He said, that's nearly a thousand he'd have to eat. I said, well, he did. He said, well, quite frankly, Mr. Norton, he said, I don't believe your story. You know the way they talk. <laughs> and he said, unless you can produce this colleague. He said, I should afraid that the Inland Revenue will be prosecuting you for fraud. So I said, well, of course I can produce him. I said, what's more, if you'll come to Fred's Fish and Chip Shop next Thursday, he'll be there. He said, I will be there next Thursday at lunchtime. And there we left it. And it was on this particular Thursday that I'd met Frank there in the gutter. And I suddenly thought, this is the man, a man as hungry as this. He is my only chance. So I took him back to my luxury flat over the chemist shop in the parade <laughs> and I outfitted him in a tweed suit and a bow tie sprayed him down a bit with aftershave lotion <laughs> and took him to Fred's fish and chip shop where the tax inspector was waiting and the waiter came up it was one of these kind of expatriate mafia that they have in these places <laughs> and I said um, three portions of fish and chips please with the uh, 67 and a half portions of extra chips for my friend. <laughs> which he bought and Frank woofed the lot. Not only woofed them, but sat back after them and said, what's for put? <laughs> well, as you can imagine, the inspector was duly impressed and went out full of apologies and I hope indigestion. <laughs> and I turned to Frank and said, thank you very much, my good man. Here's something for your trouble and pressed a sixpence into his hand. <laughs> which he waved aside and said, I think I'm onto a better thing than that. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, he said, unless you take me into partnership in whatever racket you're engaged in, he said, I shall spill the whole beans to the constabulary. <laughs> and that is how our long and happy association started. <laughs> now, you look as if you don't believe this. And in fact, it is hard to believe. In fact, every time I look across the stage at Frank, I think to myself, was this the face that lunched on a thousand chips? <laughs> Pack of lies. <laughs>
<laughs> well, the secret's out at last. I always wanted to know how they began in partnership. Now I know. So we go on to Frank Muir. Heaven knows what he's going to say. But his quotation was, a rose-red city half as old as time. I had one of those humiliating experiences with my son about five years ago. As my wife was, um, was out for the afternoon shopping, I lent him my tennis racket and said, go and bang a ball against the side of the house and keep out of mischief. That's the side of the house where there are no windows. <laughs> now. And, uh, <laughs> he... <laughs> about 20 minutes later, he came back and the behind was out of his new jeans. So I said to him, what, what's happened? What's happened with those new jeans? He said, it was an accident. A rose-red city, half as old as time. You know, because O.O.'s got a new puppy. I said, O.O.? Oh, oh. The boy next door's called Robert. He said, no, no, we call him O.O. Seven, because his mummy gave him a packet of that stuff who sprinkled down cracks in the cement. And from then on, we called him 007 because he's licensed to kill ants. <laughs> and, and O.O.'s got this new puppy, you see, which is terribly docile because his mummy wouldn't let him have it until the lady guaranteed that it was docile. And then, of course, tying Sally to the tree, and then I accidentally cut the string on the tennis racket. He said, Daddy, do you know it's only one string? <laughs> He said, but I needed the string, you see, because I had to tie Sally to the tree because she was being mini uh uh So I wanted to tie her to the tree because I was going to scalp her. And, um, and then I wanted to, to put the voodoo on her, you see, Daddy. So I, I went into the, in, in, back into the kitchen, and in the refrigerator I found a bone. So I, I said, there wasn't a bone in the refrigerator. He said, well, there's a bit of red meat stuff around it, but there's a bone in the middle. <laughs> I cut the meat away, Daddy, and, and uh, I got the bone, and I went back and I put the voodoo on Sally. I said, you're mini uh, uh and I point this bone towards you, and she got out. She got away from her bondages, and she skated right into the long grass, and, whoosh, and she ran, and she disappeared into the long grass in the orchard. So I wondered what to do. Then I thought, you see, Daddy, I thought of, of O.O.'s uh, dog next door, his little puppy which is a red setter, and Heifer sold it. I said, Heifer? He said, he bought it from that lady, you know, that, that old lady with the large legs and the moustache. <laughs> Mrs. Constable Spoffoff. <laughs> he said, well, uh, Sally actually heard you saying to Mammy that she was a bit of a cow. So ever so... <laughs> so Heifer, you see, had sold this lovely puppy daddy with huge feet, and it's all a sort of red colour, and... Um, the, uh, the, the puppy was guaranteed docile because the last one bit O.O. But Mrs. Potter said, no, no, he's terribly calm. It won't hurt children. And uh, we never played with the puppy. And I thought, here's a chance because we can see the puppy's a hunter. See if it'll hunt things out. And what was said, it's hunting Sally in the long grass. So I went, shh, shh, oh, I said, and, okay. and I lay down in the long grass. And I said, come on, dog. Come on, and uh, just waiting for this red setter to bound up, and suddenly, oh, death, it was terrible. It was like, uh, 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 and all slathering, and all jaws, and, and tufts of sort of really fur jumped on me, jumped on my back as I was lying on the grass, and uh, uh, like a his claws going, going all, all, out, all out my back. And suddenly, there's a terrible, rendy <laughs> sound, and suddenly, my bottom felt all cold. <laughs> And, and when I looked up, Daddy, the, the little red setter puppy was, was galloping all back towards um, O.O.'s house, and it had the bone, which was in my hip pocket, you see, Daddy. <laughs> and also um, the hip pocket, too, <laughs> uh, 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 in its mouth. And, um, and that, was, that, that, that was how it happened. So I said it was this supposedly guaranteed docile puppy that did it. He looked at me as though I was an idiot. <laughs> Daddy, I told you when you asked me. And I remembered I'd said, what brought about this expensive accident? And he replied, O.O.'s red setter, heifer sold as tame. <laughs> Well, 
Life must be very exciting with the Muir family. <laughs> By your vote, Dennis Norton wins the competition of the two stories, and that brings us to a final score in which, nevertheless, Dillis Powell and Frank Muir win by two marks from Anne Scott James and Dennis, and it also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.